I didn't I can't believe that's what's happening to me. But in reality, everyone, there was a lot of overlap and experiences. So I think providing information to help people prepare for a cessation journey to know what can be expected will help them stay on track. And lastly, the disassociation with culture is an opportunity for early education and intervention. Um, I think for a long time, I and mean, this is changing, culture was a barrier to doing any kind of education, prevention, intervention, um, service or program because people were afraid of cultural erasure. But now that we are seeing some, the impact of high rates of oral cancer and consequent, consequently death, people are changing their mind about what, what is so cultural about chewing. And so I think this is an opportunity to introduce an early education and intervention at a school level, especially because most of my participants started chewing when they were in elementary, middle school, high school. And the seed of my data still shows today that that is the age that people, that kids start chewing. Um, and so in this quote, this person said, I think we need to put education into the schools because we don't know chewing, it's cancerous. And look at me, I don't even know what the exact cause is. And then this other person said, um, a lot of young kids now, they just chew just to try it. And you know, they add cigarette and that's not our culture. It's becoming more of like just being in a group kind of thing. And, and, so, and so, did you say 10 minutes? Um, minutes. Okay. Um, yeah, so the, the introduction of this at an earlier stage will then hopefully prevent dependence into adulthood and lower our um, oral cancer rates and our mortality rates from oral cancer. And that is it. Sisus Moasi, thank you guys so much. Thank you, Sammy. Great job. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to pause to see if there are any questions. And if it looks like Claire, you've raised your hand. Do you have a question? Go ahead. Yes, I do. First, Sammy, thank you for that presentation. Your slides are beautiful and you're a great presenter. <clears throat> My mom literally just came back from Saipan. So you have a very beautiful country. Yeah. Wow. So I wanted to ask about your last theme. Super interesting. I don't know if you know this, but do you know whether if now that this is becoming less culturally relevant, are people doing other drugs, maybe cigarettes, vaping or other harder drugs? Um, so people are substituting uh Part of the chewing is a nicotine habit with the introduction of tobacco. So some people are substituting that with vaping, especially people that are um, my age and younger. Um, but that's really the only substitution is the is for the nicotine replacement. Great, thank you. Great job. Thank you. Yeah, um, I. I see a lot of positive um, remarks in the chat. I might, might I throw out a question um, since it, it doesn't look like there is another um, right yet. Um, so you gave uh, many wonderful recommendations for how to move forward. I wonder if you have, um, if you can elaborate on the how, you know, how to disseminate, how might be best to disseminate these educational messages. Oh, wait, and oh, sorry, someone else is, has their mic on can you sorry oh can you not hear me okay everything's fine sorry i heard another mic on continue okay there might have been an echo i uh sammy did you get my question um how would how would we do what i'm saying we should do <laughs> yeah like if there if you have thought about the process by which you could start to implement um you know educational programming and that sort of thing yeah i think definitely the the first one where we need to reframe social support in a cultural context i think is something that we can do through awareness campaigns right now the main um awareness campaign for in relation to oral cancer and we don't chewing is just that we offer free screenings at any dental clinic on island and so um and you know, they do do, sometimes the dentist will go and speak to like work sites and stuff, especially hugo chewing is um, related to very laborious jobs um, because it suppresses hunger, it keeps you alert and whatnot. So I think that, you know, going to having conversations through public health about, you know, what it means when you, you know, can, like pressure someone to chew, especially somebody who is expressing that they are, you know, that they've stopped or that they want to stop, 
is actually more harmful than beneficial because I, I think culturally we feel that it's disrespectful to not offer. And that's that's the problem. And so I we need to talk about how um, that's not disrespectful and what the respect actually, what do we mean in our culture of respect and how can that be shown in a different way? Yeah, yeah. I agree with you as someone who comes from a culture where we also pass around as we call it, arke. it's the same thing, beat on that. So thank you. I see um, Amy has her hand up next and I, I'm assuming we have time for, for one more question at least. Yes, Deepa, can we do Addie first since she's a student? Oh yeah, let's Addie, do that. Please. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry, Amy. I didn't mean to boot you. <laughs> um, <laughs> great job, Sammy. That was a um, really wonderful presentation. Um, I was wondering if there, for the peer-based um, sort of efforts, wh whether there are examples of like organized efforts or whether it happens more organically, those peer community-based um, cessation or prevention um, efforts. Yeah, um, there are examples like in the literature, but back home, um, not there's not really, this is not happening yet. Um, and through what I'm hearing, I feel like people want it to happen more organically because it's not, they don't even really want um, like the local health department to be involved with setting this up. Um, and so, yeah, it's just kind of interesting. Uh, we are a very small community. Everyone's very interconnected. And so, you know, even those who work at the health department are also, um, you know, chew beetle nut or have, you know, family members that do that. Um, so, yeah, because everything's interconnected, everything kind of almost always happens organically. But when you slap that logo on, it turns that off. It's like, oh, I don't really want to be a part of this. Like uh, somebody even said, I don't want to be part of public health statistics. Right. And so just that that um, sort of trying to figure out how we can like if this was a public health, um, like if we started it and at least brought the people together, then like making sure that we don't say this is a public health effort. Right. Because that's that's kind of what's a deterrent to people not wanting to participate um, in those kinds of services. Okay, thanks, baby. Yes, great, great job, Sami. Sammy, thank you very much. Um, I wonder if you might speak to <clears throat> the analogous situation in the United States where we have these tobacco companies that promulgate cigarettes in a commercial enterprise that's highly profitable. Is there a similar mm -hmm. sort of situation in your country where the production of this product is profitable for the companies that put it together, or is it more informal than that? Um, I think it's a little more informal because beetle nut grows in everybody's backyard. Um, so like one of the things, one of the participants said that when they quit, they went and they chopped all the trees in their yard. <laughs> um, so when it comes to the, the beetle nut, it's not, um, I think it's a reverse where families, and so this person who chopped all their trees, it also um, has to do with like climate change and our, all our typhoons where a typhoon came and knocked down all their trees. And so they lost money um, because they were selling um, their supply of pua. Uh, but like it, industry-wise, other than the tobacco, I think that's obviously the biggest, uh, we don't make that back home, but, um, even then just the pugwa, the leaves grow at home um, and then the lime. I don't know too much about how much it costs to make lime. That's like grounded limestone. Um, and so I don't know how much that costs, but I, I think that it's not as money-making as uh, like the tobacco industry. Yeah. Thank you, Sammy. Um, so uh, we have, uh, yeah, I think we're out of time. We, yeah, okay, I'm seeing Nora. Um, so thank you and for doing such a great job. Got distracted there because I'm in person, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so thank you so much. And um, we'll move on to the next presenter. And oh, Sammy, keep an eye out in the chat for any other questions that come up. Yeah, okay, great. Um, so our next presenter is Catherine Bonobi. You have the mic. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, let me get my screen shared here. Oh, 
All right. Are you all seeing the correct view, Deepa, Nora? Okay. Yes. Awesome. Perfect. Okay. So my name is Kat. Thanks for being here for my presentation on my capstone, which is an educational landscape analysis in Bukopa, Tanzania. I'll begin with some background, first by emphasizing the importance of education to health. Education has repeatedly been found to be the most important social determinant of health. It influences health directly, providing more and um, more health knowledge and indirectly through socioeconomic factors like income and place of re residence, which vary by education level and can impact health immensely. An impact of maternal education on children's health is particularly strong, making education an intergenerational determinant of health as well. And in Tanzania, where this project is based, there's a definite need for improving education. The out-of-school children rates are one indicator of the magnitude of the problem. And you can see here that nationally and in the Kagera region where this project is based, nearly a quarter of children are out of school. For Tanzania is a US-based nonprofit that's working to improve education in Tanzania. And I actually have a personal connection to this organization since my parents are the founders and the initial work is based in the village where my family is from. So I was already involved with this organization before actually starting this project. And in the short term, Core Tanzania's goal is to construct and operate Taigashe Primary School, which opened in January of 2020. And then in the long term, the organization intends to contribute to the country's educational system in a way that improves educational opportunities for students around the region and nation, not just at Taigashe. This project supports Core, Tanz Core Tanzania's work by addressing their expressed need for more information to help pursue government partnerships and to understand the educational system more deeply so that they can improve educational opportunities on a larger scale. Um, this project is set in the Kagera region, as I said, which is here in the Northwest corner of Tanzania. And the median years of education is only 3.4 3 in the region. Within Kagera then is Bukoba District Council, which I'll refer to. Um, and then in the very North of that district is Bushasha Village right here, which is the site of Toigashe Primary School. This is a rural village um, of an estimated 4,000 people over approximately 10 to 15 square miles. And prior to Togashi's opening, there was only one government primary school in the village. Currently, there are an average of 77 students per class there. And there's also one secondary school near Bushasha. It's shared by four villages, so I estimate that it draws from approximately a population of 16,000. And it's a community school, which means responsibility for its infrastructure and operation is shared by the government and the community. So the goal of this project is to support Core Tanzania and Toigashe Primary School in contributing to Tanzania's educational system by expanding educational access and quality. To do so, my aims are to understand the educational landscape in and around Bushasha and to develop a series of recommendations to support Core's efforts. Before moving on, a note on my role and positionality. First is that I'm half Tanzanian, but I was raised in the US. So I'm removed from this community, but I do have a significant, significant connection. And I also am personally connected to Court and Taigashe, as I mentioned. And then I also speak only a limited amount of Kiswahili, which is Tanzania's national language. And then my role in this project was conducting interviews and research on existing data, which I'll talk about just now. Um, I began with a review of existing data, and I've shown here the indicators that I looked at, their sources, and the geographical levels for which I was able to find the data. You can see that all the indicators were available at the national and regional levels except teacher qualifications and infrastructure. And then at the district level, the four indicators shown here were not available. My second stage is conducting interviews. And this table shows the title of my interviews, or my interviewees, which ones were originally proposed versus completed, and the interview method. I proposed seven interviews originally, but two became unavailable. Three additional became available, so I had a total of eight. And despite the shuffle, I ended up with a set that's pretty representative of the educational system with two Ministry of Education officials, head teachers from one community secondary school and one private secondary school, a teacher and a head teacher from two government primary schools and two directors of nonprofits, one that operates a pri private primary school and one that co-manages several government schools. I developed guides beforehand for semi-structured interviews and during the interviews, I took detailed notes, but I did not record them because I did not record the interviews because I felt it would be inappropriate in the setting. And then I used an inductive coding process to identify themes that emerged. 
And so beginning with a snapshot of my quantitative findings from the review of existing data, I want to point out a few highlights. First, the out-of-school children rates are higher than expected for the reported net enrollment ratios, which suggests that there are many children who are enrolled but not attending school. And then looking at test results, while primary school leaving exam pass rates are in the 80s, students scored only approximately 20% on an English literacy test. And this is very important because English is the language of instruction in secondary school. Minutes. Next, we can look at resources. There are upwards of 80 students taught by one teacher on average with the issue worse in Kagera than nationally. And we see also that the students to toilet ratios are much higher than the World Health Organization recommendation, which is 30 to one, and that not enough schools have electricity available. And even in schools with, with electricity available, it doesn't necessarily mean that, mean that the students benefit because for example, electricity can be present only in the teacher's houses and still be counted as, school with, as a school with electricity. So moving to my interviews, I found a lack of funds or barrier for all schools, but especially for government schools. Private schools struggle to have the full impact they want. For example, having insufficient funds to provide trainings for teachers from their own and other schools. And then many government and community schools have a hard time meeting more basic needs. I heard from many respondents that their schools do not have enough money for sufficient infrastructure and teaching resources, for meals for students, and extracurricular activities. They do receive capitation grants from the Ministry of Education, but as one respondent said, the capitation grants are a joke. There's no way we can operate with that amount of money. The second thing I identified was that the language of instruction policy creates a major learning barrier. The problem is more specific to government schools in which the language of instruction in primary school is Kiswahili and then it switches to English in secondary school. This graphic illustrates the problem that many respondents describe where students receive poor English preparation. So the system produces teachers who have insufficient English skills who are then teaching the next generation of students. This respondent said the dual language of instruction creates half-cooked graduates who are the master of none. Even if they do have the knowledge, they cannot express it. Then in terms of potential solutions, most respondents felt that there were pros and cons to having either Kiswahili or English as the only language of instruction in all grades, but, that, but those that expressed a preference said they would choose English. Unpreparedness for secondary school emerged as a third theme. Again, from my interviews, this was found to be more of a problem for government schools. At many of the respondent schools, there are high pass rates on the primary school leaving exam that don't correlate with preparedness. This respondent said, even the students who pass, it doesn't mean they're ready. The math test, for example, is multiple choice. You have students who are guessing and it is luck. Then they go on to secondary school, but they do not have the knowledge. The final themes concern government partnership and educational culture. I found from teachers and the Ministry of Education officials alike that the ministry does not seek educator input. One respondent said, the Ministry of Education claims to accept input from teachers, but really our input is not taken. It's the ministers who provide all the input. I'm implementing what they say. Respondents also described a culture and system that prioritizes hiring quantity rather than quality of teachers and expressed that the system is not supportive to them or their students. Um, I found that there's definitely opportunity for a partnership with the government and its own schools. Many respondents gave examples of existing partnerships between schools, sharing sports facilities, for example. And one respondent in particular discussed our private schools partnering with the government to provide a new training for government and private school teachers. So um, in summary, just to bring it all together, um, I found that one, there's a lack of sufficient funds and resources, particularly in government schools. Two, there's a need for more teachers with better English skill and teaching materials. Three, there may be a preference for English only rather than keep Swahili only as a solution to the language of instruction problem. And finally, there's a definite potential for partnership between the government and private school system. Um, just a couple of limitations before I uh, talk about my recommendations. I did have some instances where data wasn't available for all the geographical levels I was looking at or not available in the correct year. Um, there were instances of conflicting data between sources. So I note those in my report, but truthfully the exact data points aren't as important as the themes that emerged. Um, then my interviews, I had smaller sample size, um, especially limited Ministry of Education representation, but I was still able to achieve saturation and pretty good representation of the educational system as a whole. I also conducted my interviews in English, except for one, um, but English being most respondents second or third language means there may have been misunderstandings or misinterpretations. And then it's also possible that because my parents and I are familiar to most of the respondents, there may have been some desirability bias in their responses. 
And finally, my findings are possibly not generalizable, but truthfully, they were not designed to be as their purpose is to specifically support core Tanzania, which brings me to my recommendation. Um, this is a sample from a larger list, but first I recommend that CORE collaborates with the Ministry of Education to operate as co-manager of government schools in order to improve standards in the government system. Second, I recommend that Tregashi shares school facilities like sports fields, library and technology with other schools. Third is for Tregashi to provide English classes for their own teachers and other local teachers. This would be integrated into the adult education series that Tregashi already plans to offer. And my fourth recommendation is for CORE to collaborate with other NGOs and private schools to share costs to provide teacher trainings for government and non-government teachers. And the last recommendation I'll share is for Tegashe to collaborate with the government to develop a program in which teacher candidates serve as student teachers at Tegashe before being placed at government schools. And so, in closing, a huge thank you to all my interviewees and to the Tegashe community and to um, Steve, my chair, and Marco, my um, other committee member. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Kat. Nice work. And I'm so happy to hear that you're, you conducted a project so close to your heart. Um, just going to pause to see if there's a, are there are any questions from the audience. Looks like Steve um, got one. Yeah, yeah. We'll start with a question from Steve, who says, excellent presentation. A very useful document for CORE. Question, what is the policy of the government of Tanzania regarding inclusion, inclusion of private slash NGO schools within the government educational network? Um, yeah, so there is some level of partnership between government and private schools, but they are, they are separate systems, um, but the government kind of has control over the private schools nonetheless. Um, so for example, private schools have to follow the government curriculum. They can add to the curriculum, but they have to have the um, basic government curriculum as their basis. Um, the government sets all the standards for the private schools. And interestingly, they're much more stringent about those standards in private schools than they are in their own government schools. Um, so they are separate um, systems, but the government is involved with, with private schools. And so I think that's why there is, um, why it's feasible to think that Core Tanzania and Tregashe might try to lean into that um, opportunity for partnership. Great, thank you. Um, maybe I'll throw out a question because I, I see a lot of, um, exclamations of how wonderful your presentation was, Kat. And I'll, maybe I'll just jump onto that and add that I um, wanted to acknowledge um, you did a really nice job of kind of recognizing your positionality at various points in the project. And I wonder if um, I might ask you to go in more depth a little bit and um, talk a little bit about how your positionality might have affected your interpretation and recommendations. Have you, I don't know if you've um, thought about that, but it might be an interesting thing to explore. Yeah, um, I do think having, having family in this, in Bushasha and having been there um, and been involved at the school, um, that allowed me to have some like ideas sort of already going in into the project. And so um, I think there is good and bad to that, right? Because um, I maybe had some like preformed ideas, but also I do think that having that context is really important to be able to make recommendations that are actually feasible and might be useful um and are like appropriate for the for the setting um yeah so i i think and i i did try i tried very much to um really make my recommendations based off of what i was hearing as opposed to what um i may have already come in with okay thank you thank you for speaking to that 
I think we're out of time, right, Nora? Yeah. Yes, we're out of time. But if anybody else has any other questions, please put them in the chat. And Kat, will you look out to see if there are any other questions that you can answer on yeah, chat? I will. Okay, thank you. Uh, so thank next you. we have um, Sarah Wozniak. So um, if you're here, I give the floor and the mic to you. Thank you. Can you see that? Yep. Yes, we can. Okay. Awesome, thank you. Um, so hi, my name is Sarah and I'm excited to share with you results from my thesis that's on quantifying the lagged effects of non-optimal temperature exposure on the risk of cause-specific mortality. Um, this thesis was chaired by Katrin Burkhart and was also supervised by Jeff Stanley and Kai Chen. I would like to acknowledge that we are on the traditional unceded land of the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish people, past and present, and honor with gratitude the land itself and the Duwamish tribe. This is my positionality, and I wanted to especially highlight that I live in a high-income country where my privilege in Seattle and at this institution includes having easy access to temperature mitigation strategies, so I will not be on the receiving end of extreme temperature impacts. For this project, we define non-optimal temperature exposure as both extreme heat and extreme cold that's beyond the temperature associated with the lowest disease burden. A large body of literature links non-optimal temperature with diverse human health impacts. 17 of these were previously included in the Global Burden of Disease Study in 2019 um, due to the strength of their evidence, and they were included as mortality outcomes only. We divide these into two different categories. The first is communicable and non-communicable causes, which I'm just gonna be referring to as non-external causes. And then the second category are external causes of death. Previous evidence has shown that the effects of extreme heat and cold are not confined to the single day on which they were experienced. Instead, they also extend into lag periods, which are the days and weeks following the extreme temperature. Researchers have found that heat effects tend to be shorter and are usually just confined to a few days, while cold effects can last longer, extending for multiple days or even for weeks. However, current evidence is very heterogeneous regarding the actual length of these lag effects. People have also found the presence of mortality advancement. This is displacement of mortality, where deaths are advanced by a few days due to an extreme weather event. This is also called harvesting. To make sure we're taking into account both harvesting and these different varying lag effects, for this project, we chose to examine a maximum lag period of 21 days. Last year, Katrin, Jeff, and other members of the team at IHME conducted an analysis to create relative risk curves for each of the 17 outcomes that I described on the previous slide. They found that the shape of the relative risk curves varies between the different causes. Non-external causes tend to have J-shaped curves, and one example is COPD, which is over here on the right, and, and external causes um, have monotonically increasing risk curves, such as drowning. Currently, the curves that we're using for the GDB do not include any lagged effects. This means that we need to explore whether we're underestimating burden due to leaving out these lagged effects, and we also don't understand the structure of lagged effects for cause-specific risk curves. Um, to my knowledge, lagged analysis has only been conducted on all cause mortality so far. This project aims to fill these knowledge gaps by performing analysis of uh, lagged curves for cause specific curves. The main aims are developing a set of curves with lags, comparing these new curves to the old curves that did not include lags, and then comparing the relative risk for the new curves across different lag periods. There are two main data sources that went into this analysis. For exposure, we use the ERA-5 global temperature estimates, and for outcomes, we use daily cause-specific mortality count data. These were coded with ICD codes and were available from seven different countries on the subnational level. We matched the mortality data to temperature exposure information from the temperature estimates. There are two stages to this analysis. The first is the distributed lag nonlinear modeling stage, and the second is a mixed effects meta-regression. We conducted each of these stages separately for the 17 causes of interest that I described previously. The goal of the first stage was to produce relative risk estimates from the mortality data set. To do this, we used the DLNM framework, which was developed by Gasparini and colleagues. Um, this allowed us to fit a surface to the mortality observations that was based on daily temperature and lags. We then reduced the surface to produce cumulative relative risk estimates. Um, these are summaries of the net effect of temperature, including all of the associated lag periods. Um, and this figure just shows an example of what one of these um, individual surfaces would have looked like. After we um, completed the DLNM stage, we then had a set of cumulative relative risk predictions for each of the administrative units. 
we wanted to meta regress these so that we could generate a set of relative risk curves that we could apply globally. To do this, we, um, and we used uh, the Mr. Burt meta regression tool. We expect the relationship between daily temperature and relative risk of mortality to vary depending on how hot or cold the baseline temperature is. So to address this, we split the input data into different temperature zones. We then used a two-dimensional spline framework to fit a surface that was predicted by daily temperature and temperature zone. Um, an example of one of these surfaces is on the right with daily temperature on the y-axis and temperature zone on the x-axis. Based on the previous analyses, um, we expected the shape of the curves to vary for non-external and external causes. So we fixed different priors, which are described below. And the end result from the stage was a set of cause-specific curves for each temperature zone, which fulfilled aim one of the project. Five minutes. For aim two, we compared relative risks from our new curves to the older curves that did not include lags. This plot is one example of that for lower respiratory infections. On the x-axis is daily temperature and on the y-axis is the log relative risk. These plots are faceted by temperature zone, which is gonna be the same for all the plots I'll show for this project's um, results. Displaying multiple zones at the same time shows how daily temperatures uh, have different responses um, for different zones. The zones included here are for eight, 12, 16, 20, 24, and 28 degrees. Um, and on the top left of the plot series um, is the coldest zone, so places like Alaska, while the bottom right is for the warmest zone, which would include a lot of um, equatorial locations. For this plot, um, purple curves are the older curves that include no lag. Orange curves are the new curves with the entire 21 day lag period. And um, when the orange curve is higher than the purple curve, this indicates the relative risk is elevated due to lag effects. Cold effects are relative rel elevated relative risk to the left of the curve's minimum. Um, so like anything over here, and then heat effects are elevated relative risk to the right of the curve's minimum. For non-external causes, we found that there were lagged effects for heat and cold for almost all of the zones. Um, so for LRI, you can see that lagged effects are easily apparent for cold for all the zones. Lagged effects for heat are also observed, but only at the warmer temperature zones. So in general, um, lower respiratory infections are a good example of this pattern for non-external causes, where we see strong cold lag effects with heat effects that emerge at the warmer temperature zones. For external causes, we found that lag effects were less pronounced. Um, they're more pronounced at moderate temperature zones and less pronounced at temperature extremes, as you can see here for drowning. This could be explained by a lack of data, especially because the number of mortality observations is so much smaller for the external causes compared to the non-external causes. Um, for AIM-3, we compared the relative risk curves across different lag periods. This plot visualizes that for LRI. The magenta curve, um, which is this top curve here, is the same as the orange curve from the previous plot. Um, the blue curve doesn't include lags. And then um, there are also two additional curves representing seven and 14 day lag periods that are shown in indigo and purple. Similar to previous evidence, um, for non-external causes, we found that cold effects display longer lag periods than heat effects. For cold, differences between the lags were also more pronounced. For some outcomes, such as LRI here, the differences between lags are less pronounced for heat. Um, but for most heat effects, we saw that the 21 day lag period had lower relative risk than the other lag periods for most temperature zones. I also wanted to show stroke as an example of the presence of harvesting. Um, for both cold and heat effects, you can see that for some temperature zones, the 14 day or even the seven day lag period has a higher relative risk than the 21 day lag period. We also observed harvesting for other external and non-external causes. Finally, I wanted to note that the differences between lags were less pronounced for the external causes, and where they did occur, there was no easily identifiable pattern. Two minutes. There are several important limitations to this project. Um, because the modeling framework is complex, that also means that it's less flexible and less robust. So one strength of our um, 2D spline framework through Mr. Burt is that we can borrow information from the observation-rich zones to generate predictions for places where we have fewer observations. But a downside to this is that when the relationships at the extremes don't match the relationships for the rest of the surface, um, this means the model doesn't end up fitting the data as well as we would like. So one example is um, where relationships deviate from J-shaped curves for the non-external causes, the model isn't as flexible in fitting these. Um, this is also an ecological analysis, so it was impossible for us to match individual mortality outcomes with the actual daily temperature exposures that people experience. Um, and then this analysis was also impacted by data availability issues. We only had seven um, countries from which we got, uh, which we received data. 
And one way this data sparsity showed up is that we saw a lactic cold effect for extreme temperature zones for most of the non-external causes, except for lower respiratory infections. As with previous studies, this analysis showed that the shape of the exposure response relationships is different for external and non-external causes. We also added to our previous understanding by showing that lagged effects for heat and cold do exist for these causes, but that the structure of the lagged effects varies between causes and temperature zones. We found that including a maximum lag of 21 days is useful because it allows us to capture lagged effects as well as harvesting. Um, all of this means that uh, for the Global Burden of Disease project, we are currently likely underestimating the disease burden of non-optimal temperature, especially for cold, which is where we saw the strongest lag effects. Next steps for this analysis include testing covariates to incorporate some measure of human adaptability, as well as assessing the strength of evidence through this score. Um, I wanted to end by thanking Katrin for being an outstanding thesis chair. Um, and also wanted to thank Jeff and Kai. I would also like to extend special thanks to Pung if he's here uh, for his central contributions without whom none of this work would have been possible at all. And then I um, finally wanted to thank Mike and the rest of the environment, occupation and diet teams, um, as well as the math team at IGN. And um, I would appreciate any questions or feedback. Great job, Sarah. Okay, um, I'm gonna just pause for a second to see if there are any questions and I can uh, throw out one that may be a, a curveball question for you I don't know <laughs> um, so so my question is um, you know I'm a social scientist so I, I'm gonna probably be asking more of those types of questions today but um, could you kind of um, maybe explain what recommendations you might have for policymakers based on this data? You know, how would you distill this information for messaging to, you know, a policymaker type of audience? Um, so I think a lot of the findings that we found are pretty expected, which is that um, extreme temperatures are bad and global warming is definitely going to make things worse. I think one finding that I would especially want to highlight is um, because we did end up finding lag defects for heat in addition to cold. Um, this means that uh, health disparities that are already experienced because of extreme temperatures are only going to increase with global warming. Um, so previous studies have shown that um, temperature burden is going to increase due to climate change and that the burden is going to be concentrated in um, warmer countries that are already experiencing a uh, high burden due to external causes. And this shows that um, those effects are going to be even more pronounced. Great. Thank you for that question and that answer, Sarah. Um, there is a question from Rose who says, uh, is the general implication of this that the GBD may be underestimating the effect of cold on health? Are there any plans to incorporate these lagged effects into GBD? Um, so thanks, Rose. So yes to the first part of the question. Um, we are currently working on uh, incorporating this for future cycles of the GBD. But as I mentioned um, at the end of my presentation, we wanted to explore um, whether or not we can add some covariates or just further refine the analyses before incorporating those. Um, so one example would be that we are thinking about incorporating sociodemographic index as a covariate so that we can measure um, uh, what, how people are adapting to climate change, uh, or sorry, adapting to extreme temperatures because right now we're not including anything like air conditioning or insulated housing or any of those other adaptive uh, strategies right now. Okay, great. Oh, it looks like you have one more question. Yeah, so uh, last question is from Katrin, who says, for the GBD, uh, we try to derive exposure global impacts. Where do you think we are not getting it right? And what could we do to do better? Hi, Katrin. Thank you. Um, what do you mean by exposure global impact? Sorry, uh, I, I was typing in the window, <laughs> which totally went wrong. Um, I mean, I meant we're trying to derive um, global exposure response function. So we're really trying to derive the impact for every location, which comes with some approximations. And where do you feel like we're good in what areas or what regions and where are we not that great? And what could we do to be better in these areas? Um, so I think there's two main things. Uh, this is also based on my work from air pollution, but um, one of them is that I think we're not as good at characterizing exposure response relationships at extremes 
Um, so places where there's either like a very high exposure or a very low exposure. And this is like especially critical for temperature. Um, and then uh, especially I wanted to note that we are not as good at characterizing these relationships where we don't have data. And um, this is a huge issue for air pollution as well as temperature, but a lot of these studies are conducted in high income countries, which means that we are definitely not doing as good of a job with characterizing relative risks for low and middle income countries, um, which is especially important because this is where like the bulk of the burden from temperature is going to um, be impactful. So it's definitely like a health equity issue and a really good way to improve our models in the future. Thanks for the question, Katrin. <laughs> Great, Sarah, thank you so much for a great presentation and Q&A. Um, I believe we are out of time. So if there are any other questions that come up, keep your eye on the chat and uh, we'll move on to the next presenter who is Sophie Che. Sophie, floor is yours. Yay. Yay. Good morning, my name is Sophia Matai Shea, or Sophie, and my thesis is looking at the experiences accessing healthcare services during COVID-19 among persons living with, with HIV in Western Washington. I just wanted to start off by acknowledging my positionality. I was born in Cambodia and were raised in Olympia, Washington. I identify as cisgender heterosexual female. I'm a first-gen college student. I do not have any personal experiences with HIV AIDS and have limited experiences conduct HIV research. And I, I, I have been a health navigator for my family since I was 12 years old, and I worked as a clinical case manager for mental health clients. And here's a picture of me in the traditional um, Khmer ballet performing a blessing dance. It is usually performed at the start of an event to give blessing and wish everyone happiness and prosperity. It is an important factor in my culture and in my life. So for the background, we know that social distancing has impacted our life in many ways. Social distancing guidelines and regulation have posed significant challenges to the healthcare system, changing access to care and how care is being provided. People with advanced HIV and those who are not on treatment are more at risk for severe outcome from COVID-19 compared with other people. COVID-19, UN8 has warned that social distancing has the potential to greatly disrupt HIV care continuum outcomes among persons living with HIV. There are two research aims for this study. Research aim number one, to examine the facilitator and barrier to access to healthcare services among persons living with HIV in Western Washington. The second aim is to explore persons living with HIV experiences and their satisfactions with healthcare innovation rolled out during COVID-19 social distancing, such as telemedicine, pharmacy delivery services, ETC. There are two conceptual models that being adopted here. Um, the, Anderson, the Anderson behavioral model is a multi-level uh, model that incorporates both social and the contextual determinant of uh, health service use. From this, we focus on the environment, population characteristics, health behavior, and the outcomes, which is the health care utilizations and consumer satisfactions. We also incorporate the five domains from the Panchansky and Thomas access to care model and those include accessibility, acceptability, accommodations, affordability, and availability. And um, those factors are under enabling factor, which then um, help us understand access to care and also in relation to consumer satisfactions. For the method of the study, um, for the survey portions, 397 participants participated. They were recruited from the UW HIV pages, uh, patient registry via email and telephone. Um, they must be 18 years and older, enrolled in HIV care at the Madison Clinic site, and they must have access to the internet and email and the survey conducted on FedCap in the English language. For the IDI um, individual in-depth interview population, 24 patients um, participated in the study. We used uh, purposive sampling from the high and lower tiers of COVID stress score with a range of age, gender, sexual orientation, and race ethnicity. And um, those participants were selected from the survey, the survey participant who agreed to be conducted for the interview. For the data collection for the IDIs, um, it was a semi-structured in-depth individual interview that were conducted in English. The interview conducted and recorded using Zoom functions. The first draft of the transcript were produced using Otter software, and then later were um, reviewed by the study team for accuracy. For the data analysis, we used both deductive and inductive process to coding. There were two primary coders um, and met to achieve a consensus. 10 transcripts were double coded out of the 34. 
thematic analysis were employed uh, by reviewing the queries and memos for each code category for, um, for patterns under each code categories. Um, for the result, um, the demographic characteristic, the average age of the participant is 47, ranging from 28 to 6, 67 years. 75% um, of the participants were identified as male, 67 were identified as gay, homosexual, or lesbian. Um, the white participant made up about 67%. For theme one, we have identified that fear of contracting the COVID-19 virus is a factor in delaying care, and that were mentioned by most of the participants. And people would reschedule or cancel their um, appointment because of the anxiety. For instance, this participant mentions that going to the hospital doesn't make her feel secure, and that um, it makes her feel scared, and that um, if her medicine stopped working, she rather stay at home and deal with it at home than go to the hospital. And kind of the overall um, picture for this um, social distancing impacted the environmental factors that affect patient perceived risk and their acceptability toward the healthcare system, which then result into delaying care. Five minutes. For theme two, we have identified that social distancing changes the healthcare delivery methods. Um, by expanding new healthcare innovation, innovations such as um, telemedicine, that um, is an example here. Telemedicine, in this case, act as an accommodation factor, follow, um, allowing people who has access and the ability to use Zoom um, to have access to care with no issues, while those who have more challenges using Zoom has to rely on other modes of care delivery for access, such as phone call in this case. Um, for instance, this person who live on Zoom, who feel comfortable using Zoom, has no issue with telemedicine, but this person has to rely um, on to phone and they didn't use Zoom because they didn't know how to use Zoom. Um, for no theme number three, we have identified that social distancing making access more difficult for some, um, but not for others. Um, for instance, one participant stated, the one second thing though is that the Medicaid, the Apple, the Apple Health, it won't give you three months of med at one time. And it only lets you take one. So that's where you, the major change was for me is that I do not have to go into the pharmacy every month. This well, one participant also shares similar um, mention that were mentioned by um, other participants as well is the changes in um, insurance coverage due to unemployment or job change because of COVID. And then another participant stated um, in regard to the access to um, assisted um, transportation services, such as Hopeling, they had to cancel their last appointment because they couldn't make it because Hopeling stopped giving them ride. And in this case, there's a need for insurance coverage, transportation assistance, and the enabling factor in this case is lack of combination um, to refill frequency, limited availability of assisted transportation services which then result in delaying care. For the discussions, the process and procedure of accessing HIV care have been impacted by social distancing, and some acknowledge that the quality of care is still the same, um, HIV care specific. Um, healthcare utilization is influenced by acceptability of patient with the healthcare facility safety measures and their perceived risk of the contracting the virus. New, new healthcare innovation act as accommodation to increase healthcare utilization utilization and our facilitator factors for some participants. And participants who rely on public social services express more difficulty ac uh, accessing healthcare services during COVID-19. Um, some express dissatisfactions and or delay um, in access healthcare services due to in, um, insurance coverage, assisted transportation, UTC. For the conclusions, the impact of COVID and social distancing on access to healthcare services are varied among these populations. There appear to be disparity in access um, to healthcare services, where more vulnerable patients who require social services to help in care engagement express greater challenges. And despite recent innovations in healthcare delivery in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, um, current and future healthcare innovations um, should be carefully evaluated and provided with adjunctive services if needed in order to ensure equitable healthcare access. There are several limitations to this study, for example, uh, for example, the sampling bias where the patient um, that participated 
has to be selected from the survey and they have to have access to and we're able to use email or phone and we have to be um, proficient in the English language. And the question on healthcare services and use were a secondary focus of the Baker study. And for the sample size, it was not clear that um, the saturation was reached for every theme. And for the acknowledgement, I just uh, wanted to acknowledge this study would not have been possible if not for the study participant. I want to say thank you and um, want to show how much I appreciate my committee, Dr. Susan Graham and Dr. Christina Bima Sophie, for your guidance, support professionally and um, personally through this experience. Thank you to the HIV and COVID study team member, uh, listed below. I want to say thank you to my family, mentor, and friends that are here today for your encouragement uh, throughout this process. And thank you everyone for being here and for um, listening to this presentation. Thank you, Sophie. Really nice job with the presentation and really, really interesting study and results. Um, I'll throw out a quick question, if it's okay. Uh, Deepa, there's a question oh. from a student. Okay, yes, we will prioritize a student question. So <laughs> go ahead and read it off. <laughs> so the question um, is from Maggie, who says, great job. Was there any evidence of delayed diagnosis slash testing due to lack of care seeking or routine testing? Um, from this study, we did not uh, find any delay in testing, fortunately. Um, however, there's one participant that we're referring to her um, friend that were missed delay in diagnosing cancer. Um, I think it was delayed for like two months and her cancer was progressive. But I think in terms of HIV care, there was no um, impact to that extent or that were not mentioned by the participants. Thank you for responding. Uh, there's a question from Claire. Claire, go ahead and ask away. Thanks, Nora. Hi, Sophie. Congratulations. Great job. I really, really loved your presentation. I agree with Nora that your positionality statement was really great thinking about how you serve as a health navigator for your family. And I'm sure you thought about that a lot doing your work. So you had a lot of findings, all of which were really great, but I'm curious to hear from you. What is like the one key takeaway that you have from this work? Yeah, thank you so much for, your, um, for being here and uh, for your questions. I think the one main takeaway is that there's a lot of other things that um, still unknown, um, you know, from the social distancing, because we're kind of in it, even though like we out of it in some ways. But I think there is still a lot of things that we don't know yet. And I think there need to be uh, more study looking at um, the impact of COVID-19 on um, healthcare access. Great. Thank you so much. Congrats again. Thank you. Yeah. Just uh, so I can pause again, I put my question in the chat, but is there another one, Nora, that I missed? Nope. So you can go ahead, Diva, or I can read it. <laughs> oh, I'll read it. It's fine. Um, Sophie, I was just, uh, I think you mentioned telemedicine in your presentation. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about, um, you know, positive impacts of access to telemedicine, any positive impressions, um, just because, you know, we point to a lot of systemic factors when we talk about access, you know, with insurance and transportation. And telemedicine is one area where it's almost like low hanging fruit where the system can change. So I'm just wondering if 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 there if you'd recommend after hearing the responses an expansion of telemedicine services even post COVID. Yeah. So um, interestingly, I'm just going to talk about the number of what I've discovered. Um, so only six out of um, 24 participants express um, positively, positivity, um, how do you say it, feedback or experiences using telemedicine. And for them, it's great, right? They don't have to think about child care or um, transportation. And um, because some participants live, one participant in particular live really far. And for her, it saved her a lot of money and time to drive back and forth because the drive time back and forth is four hours. And that for that participant, she loved it. Um, and for other participants, um, I think only about three that express kind of negative experiences using telemedicine because um, it was a bit confusing for them because it's newer. Um, and then for other people, they 
prefer face to face because of that social aspect of it. Um, and it's also important to acknowledge as well that um, I think about four or five participants um, have not used telemedicines at all since um, the start of social uh, social distancing. So um, I think there's, I would not say I would recommend it or would not, uh, would or would not, because I think there need to be more study um, for that. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, we're at time. Okay, great. So we'll, um, congratulations on, on completing that portion and we'll move to the next uh, speaker who is Rahme Abu Shweme. So you are next. And we'll hand you over the mic. Um, can you all see my screen? Great. Uh, just for the record, I apologize. I'm going to turn off my camera because I have poor internet connection and I will turn it back on for questions. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so hi everyone. Uh, my name is Jahme Abshweme, and I am a second year MPH student at the Department of Global Health. And uh, today I will be presenting my work in progress um, and my preliminary results of my thesis titled Evaluating the Adaptations and Perceptions of Sustainability and uh, for Sustaining the Implementation of Open Alice and Code of Far Using the Dynamic Sustainability Framework. Um, so before diving in into the presentation, these are some of the terminology that I will be using frequently throughout the presentation um, that uh, would be worthwhile to, familiar, to familiarize yourselves with. Um, so first to walk through the background and the story behind Open Atlas, which is in, uh, implemented in Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, Cote d'Ivoire is a Francophone West African country that is still in an ongoing battle with many life-threatening communicable diseases and um, has more, more than 380,000 people living with HIV and with a tuberculosis incidence rate of 1,350 per 100,000 people, according to UNAIDS. Uh, in 2010, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief implemented um, for, for AIDS Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, PEPFAR, implemented an earmark HIV testing and counseling interventions to eliminate the burden of HIV in Cote d'Ivoire, but as this was not a standalone solution for this problem and um, the need for a more sustainable solution was deemed necessary, uh, especially to meet the Sustainable Development Goal 3 and to fulfill the UN pledge of ending HIV by 2030. Uh, so the Center of um, the Center for Disease and Prevention, uh, through support from PEPFAR, responded by granting the, the International Training and Education Sister, Center for Health, um, which is IPEC, at the University of Washington, the Lab Kuzai project in two, 2016 to enhance and strengthen the quality and access of HIV testing. Um, this was a very important intervention because laboratory information systems are now recognized as one of the most important cornerstone interventions in health systems, um, in health system strengthening and um, as it supports detecting and screening for diseases and managing medical uh, registries. So IDIC has implemented the project over five years uh, from 2016 to 2021. And uh, currently there is um, another PhD student at the Department of Global Health uh, doing her PhD in implementation science, which I would like to acknowledge Yao He, um, who is also working on the same data data set um, for her mixed method uh, study on impact evaluation. Um, so um, while Yao yeah, will be looking at the, at the impact evaluation, I will be looking at sustainability, um, not only because it's an emerging public health topic, but it also because it's a very neglected topic. And uh, my literature review has proved uh, that um, 
sustainability does not have a universal, you know, um, a universal definition, which makes it harder to study. And also um, that um, studies studying uh, looking at laboratory information system sustainability are very scarce. So my committee and I hope that this this study will contribute to the body of literature and provide uh, some novel results and discussions on uh, sustaining the laboratory information systems. Uh, so before I deep dive in the study design, I would like to acknowledge my positionality as a Jordanian Palestinian, I'm a pharmacist by training, so I have no previous experience working in laboratory or health information systems. Um, I'm native in Arabic and fluent in English, but have um, elementary level in French. Um, I did work in previous uh, in, in previously foreign funded projects, but I have no previous experience working in either Cote d'Ivoire or any other Western African countries. Um, my role in this project comprises translating the transcripts from uh, French to English, coding the transcripts um, alongside with Gao and analyzing the data. Uh, this, this study has three main aims, um, which are, um, the first aim is to identify the adaptations that the laboratories have carried out to adopt and sustain the implementation of Open Alice. Uh, the second aim is to analyze the knowledge and perceptions of the lab's workers towards Open Alice institu institutionalization after external funding support stops. That is the funding um, from PEPFAR, which is carried through ITEC. And the third aim is to provide concrete recommendations and sustainability approaches that the Ivorian government and other stakeholders can adopt in the future. Five minutes. Um, so um, during the methodology of this project, 43 sites that implemented Open Alice, all of them have used Open Alice um, uh, to, um, all of these sites use Open Alice for HIV testing. And uh, 37 sites were chosen and semi-structured inter uh, interviews were developed in English and translated to French where native French speakers from the Ivorian ITIC team conducted in different hospitals and different national and regional levels. The transcripts were then translated to English and um, to facilitate the coding process in which the CIFR, the core checklist, and the DSF, uh, or the Dynamic Sustainability Framework, in which I will be talking more about uh, soon, were used to create the code book. Uh, then a pilot of batch, uh, a pilot batch of six transcripts were also conducted, where two coders, myself and Yao, um, have independently coded, and then we met for consensus sessions for these six transcripts. Um, Yao and I use memos uh, to document our biases and reflections throughout the coding process to eliminate any future um, biases while conducting the data or while, while analyzing the data. Sorry. Uh, we're also using Atlas TI8 for the coding and the thematic analysis process. So as I mentioned earlier, the CIFR or the Consolidated Framework for Implementation Research um, and the Quark Checklist were used to develop, and the, I'm sorry, and the Dynamic Sustainability Framework were all used to develop the code book. Um, for the sake of the time of this presentation, I won't be um, diving deep into um, these uh, frameworks or these models, uh, but in PREV, the CIFR provides a menu of contrast arranged across five domains, which you can see see, um, first of all, uh, the intervention, both unadapted and adapted, the outer sitting, uh, the individuals involved, and the, um, uh, and the uh, inner sitting and the process. Um, it can this a framework can provide a practical guide for systematically assessing potential barriers and facilitators in preparation for implementation, any innovation. Um, it was also found that it was very suitable for low and middle income country settings, and uh, therefore it was very uh, suitable for the uh, study that um, I am uh, presenting right now. Um, the CORIC checklist, which, uh, which is the consolidated criteria for reporting qualitative research, uh, was developed to promote explicit and comprehensive reporting for qualitative interviews and focus group discussions, and has 32 criteria that aims to ensure the rigor of the analysis and the credibility of the findings. Next. 
And finally, the dynamic sustainability framework um, a model that centers a few major elements and in interventions, the context in which the intervention is delivered and the broader ecological system within which the practice settings exist and operate. And as you can see, um, it is color coded and um, have um, some errors indicating uh, the changes made to fit within um, each element. Um, this is a snapshot of the codebook that uh, Yao and I are using as, and as you can see, we have also used color codes to highlight the elements in the dynamic sustainability framework. Our codebook also provide definitions for each code in addition to conclusion, um, to an inclusion and exclusion criteria. Uh, these codes are then classified in different code proofs that were driven from the CIFAR model. Um, so as I said, this is still work in progress, and I anticipate to finalize my thesis in July, but I have consolidated some preliminary findings that are summarized in uh, three key themes, which are uh, possibilities and limitations of the perceived scalability of open Alice and Cotivar on a geographical and a functional level. Uh, so that includes scaling open Alice on a national level and scaling the use of open Alice to include other laboratory tests. And uh, the extent in which the interviews perceive the interviewees perceive the sustainability of open Alice and Cotivar after the end of the funding period. And finally, facilitators and barriers that, uh, that are anticipated to affect uh, the perceptions on sustaining Open Alice after the end of uh, the funding period. Um, I am sharing uh, some of the quotes that the interviewees have shared uh, throughout the interviews on the first uh, key theme, which is the possibilities and limitations of the perceived scalability. Um, um, and these are um, coded uh, or um, referenced by the site's uh, name. Uh, so for this site, um, the interviewee said that open Alice must be extended to become national so that it becomes the common language in all laboratories. And um, another, another um, quote on the same key theme is uh, one of the interviewees from a different site said that um, as initially it was for a number of tests specifically related to people living with HIV, we, um, in the use of the software, we realized that it could be useful for the routine examination as it is in the context that we asked Mr. Paul Henry, uh, which is one of the uh, interviewers so that it can insert the other exams except microbio, which has not yet been taken into account. Um. Uh, and finally, I would like to um, thank and acknowledge the um, amazing efforts that um, the study participants have um, contributed to this project. Uh, the Ivorian team, uh, Mr. Paul Andre and uh, Yves Roland, who conducted the interviews, um, the mentor and the second coder on this project, Yao He, who has uh, supported the developing of the code book and uh, the thesis question and um, other activities, and finally, my thesis committee, Professor Lucy Perrin, uh, Professor Julia Robinson, and Professor Derek Akuku. And uh, finally, thanks to all uh, my family and friends who made it possible for me to be here today. And thank you all for listening. I'm here and, and I'm now ready to take your questions. Great, thank you so much. Great work, Rafa. I'm gonna pause to see if there are any questions from the audience particularly student questions. Claire raised her hand. So Claire, go ahead. Thank I know you. I'm asking a lot of questions, but these are such great presentations. Rame, great, great job. So I know Yao very well. You're very, very lucky to work with her. You're absolutely right. So if I remember correctly, you were taking French classes during the time that you were um, here at UW. I did also as well as, and, and as well as Yao. So I'm just curious to hear from you, how was that process learning French and then immediately having to use it to work on this project? Yeah, um, yeah, thank you, Claire, for this question. Um, taking French courses um, has definitely helped a lot. Um, at the time, I did not anticipate that 
that I'm going to use it immediately um, for my thesis. Uh, but it, it definitely came into handy um, as uh, both Yao and I were translating the transcripts. Uh, we were using Google Translate mainly as a tool for translating these transcripts, but um, some familiarity with the French language um, has definitely helped and eased the process for both of us. Great, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. I'm seeing a lot of excitement in the chat and congrats for finishing your presentation. Um, maybe I'll just throw out the next question if there are no others. Nora, you don't see any others that I'm missing? Oh, go ahead, Deepa. Okay. Um, just uh i know you presented pre preliminary results thank you for doing that it, it looks like it's going in an interesting direction i wonder if you could speak to uh where you anticipate the results going um like you know from here once you finish collecting the data what what are your next steps um so the data collection process is uh completed and uh we are currently working on uh, both coding and analyzing the data um um if I understood your question correctly, Deepa, the, the next uh, the next anticipated steps are to um, continue um, uh, coding, the, um, analyzing the data, and um, throwing um, results from these analysis, um, converting these themes into uh, converting these codes. I'm sorry, to themes, to key themes, and then uh, draw on um, the uh, key assets of um, that the interviewees has uh, perceived or has already adopted to sustain the implementation of open Alice in their laboratories and also to drive some recommendations for the Ministry of Health in Cote d'Ivoire and other stakeholders um, for future projects on how to maintain and sustain the implementation of such projects, especially that these are huge projects and needs a lot of funding. So uh, it will be very interesting to see what are the recommendations that these interviewees have shared and what suggestions have they shared. So so that um, such projects could be sustained after the funding project uh, funding period ends. Okay, thank you. Yes, you did get my question right. I misspoke though. I meant after analysis. Sure. Thank you. And, uh, yeah, thank you. Great, thank you. We are at time. Thank you so much, Rahme. Yeah, congratulations, everyone. I believe we have a five minute break next. Am I right? So Deepa, we're going to cut it. It's not going to be five. Let's give everyone two minutes. Uh, in order to just stretch, do what they got to do, and let's come back in two, two full minutes. So yeah. thank you. When we come back, Erica is going to do our presentation. Thank you. Great. And then Nora, um, you'll take it from here until yes. I return. I'll okay. take it from here. All thank right. You so see you much. in two minutes, everyone. Thank you. Erica, well, we're taking a two minute break if you'd like to share your screen. Okay, we'll do. Yes. How does that look, Nora? Looks good, everything is clear. We're gonna give everyone another one minute and then we're gonna go ahead and get started. Sounds good.
Okay, <laughs> welcome back everyone. That was the two minutes that I promised you. Um, so I'll be taking over while uh, Deepa is away at a meeting. I hope that you can hear me clearly. Um, so thank you, Ravme, for wrapping us up on the, the first half of that session. Uh, we're gonna be starting off with uh, Erica Petrick um, on her thesis presentation. So Erica, go ahead and uh, get started. Good morning, my name is Erica Petrick and I will be presenting on medical school admission requirements for previous clinical experience and marketing of short-term medical missions. I acknowledge that my positionality, particularly with regards to having pre-medical clinical experience when I apply to medical school may introduce subconscious biases. Before continuing forward, I would like to clarify terminology used within the presentation. Short-term medical missions or STMMs are defined here as having a duration of 30 days or less and are internationally based. Clinical experience is that which involves either direct or indirect patient care and may be paid or unpaid. Having this experience may be an implied or explicit requirement for medical school admissions. Since the 1990s, research has demonstrated awareness has grown of problems associated with STMMs, including poor quality of care, poor sustainability, ethical issues, and other concerns. Applications for medical school have several components. One of these components is having prior clinical experience. The emphasis placed on having prior clinical experience varies between schools and may not be clearly communicated. This and other factors lead to applicant uncertainty. Students also face a number of challenges further contributing to this uncertainty. For example, clinical experience is not typically part of undergraduate pre-medical curriculums posing a challenge for students who must self-coordinate such experiences. Students may therefore seek out participation in STMMs. The growth in number of STMMs designed to provide experience to volunteer participants, particularly students, has grown dramatically over the past several years to meet the increasing edu uh, educational demands for this experience. This research framework shows the plausible connection between medical school expectations for prior clinical experience and the development of STMMs marketing to students to meet this need, which ultimately results in the problems uh, stated earlier in this presentation. Several research aims were developed to include determining what requirements medical schools have with regards to previous clinical experience, exploring the challenges in getting this experience, finding out more about the online landscape of STMM marketing and examining opinions on student participation in STMMs. The research was designed to answer, are the expectations of medical schools for applicants to have previous clinical experience contributing to the development and marketing of short-term medical missions designed to meet this need? This is an exploratory, qualitative, quantitative, mixed method study divided into two realms of evaluation. STMMs and medical schools. The top 20 STMM websites were sampled. Qualitative coding was applied to these pages and themes generated utilizing the software program Atlas TI. Medical schools were sampled and offered a survey to elicit further information. The quantitative data obtained from these surveys was analyzed using the software RStudio. Results from qualitative coding quantitative survey data and representative quotes from both realms of evaluation, the STMMs and medical schools, were analyzed for the existence of complementary patterns to allow for data convergence and subsequent analysis and interpretation. I will now review the STMM findings. The top themes generated through qualitative coding of STMM websites are shown. The top three included students, particularly pre-medical students, being the target of the information, a drawing upon the emotional desire to help others, pictures showing students or volunteers dressed like medical professionals in what I call the future projection of self. These were examples of representative quotes from the STMM websites. I will highlight the one in the middle. Medical mission trips are your perfect chance to support a medical project abroad when you don't have much time on your hands. Ideal for students. Provided here are examples of pictures found on STMM websites. Note the theme of future projection of self. 
where volunteers are wearing something that makes them appear as an established medical provider. Note also the addition of pictures which clearly have nothing to do with clinical experience, but rather promote tourism. I will now review the medical school findings. The goal was to have 20 schools participate in, and complete surveys. Due to low response rates, the number selected to receive the survey invite was increased to 74. Ultimately, eight schools participated with 97 surveys completed. 64% of the schools were state schools, while 36% were private. 55% of respondents were faculty and 45% were students. A web query of the participating schools showed that 50% of those schools did not state one way or the other whether they required having previous clinical experience. 38% implied the requirement by including statements such as, quote, we look for students who understand healthcare teams and the role of a physician. This is typically demonstrated through prior employment and volunteer work. Only 12% explicitly stated prior clinical experience was a requirement. Here you can see that respondents overall had mixed feelings about whether a person can get into medical school without having clinical experience. This was irrespective of whether the respondent was from a school which explicitly stated this as a requirement or not. The odds of a respondent responsible for application review or interviewing saying one cannot get accepted without prior clinical experience was higher for respondents from private schools than state schools. Overall, the odds were higher in whites than in minorities. However, the results of these findings were not statistically significant. The majority of respondents who reviewed applications or interviewed students felt that pre-medical student participation in an STMM would at least moderately improve the chances of getting into the medical school. 64% of respondents expressed ethical concerns with pre-med students participating in STMMs. Provided our representative quotes, which were negative about STM participation. I will highlight the third one from a faculty staff member. Quote, typical one to two week short-term mission trips by wealthy Americans to a poor low resource community in another country clearly has the potential of causing more harm than any measurable good, end quote. Provided here are representative quotes which were positive. I will highlight the first one by a student, quote, I do feel that it is a good experience for medical students to have an introduction to healthcare in, an, in other countries, but it has to be done respectfully and with the needs of the community in mind. Of note, for the positive quotes about STMMs, most had caveats regarding how medical students should participate. In summary, faculty and staff who reviewed applications and interviewed students were inconsistent in their opinions regarding the need for prior clinical experience irrespective of the school's stated requirement. School expectations for having clinical experience are often implied. This creates a confusing setting for students, which is complicated by high competition for acceptance, such that students will likely attempt to meet the collective or implied expectations. An STMM market has developed despite the awareness of ethical concerns. This research consequently shows that a probable driver of STMM growth and marketing towards students are medical school expectations for prior cl clinical experience. Multiple limitations to this study were identified. The research design lends itself better to an exploration of trends and motivations rather than determining causality. The quantitative analysis was likely limited by the sample size. Excuse me, quantitative analysis was likely limited by the sample size. And this was independently uh, performed data collection and analysis such that inter-rater reliability is not available. Also only allopathic, that is MD US schools were examined. The following recommendations were generated from this research. The Association of American Medical Colleges, or AAMC, is a nonprofit regulatory body for medical schools. It should provide guidance on whether prior clinical experience should remain a variable when considering the good fit of a student for medicine, and define what is and what is not appropriate clinical experience. Medical schools should clarify their expectations. Elimination of the need for prior clinical experience in applicants should be considered one can argue that students, by the nature of their level of education, 
may be unaware of concepts such as scope of practice, and therefore cannot be expected to know what types of clinical experience are appropriate to participate in. Participation in STMMs whose primary purpose is to make money, train students, or provide travel and adventure should be discouraged. Pending any questions you may have, this concludes my presentation. Thank you so much, Erica. This is awesome. That was amazing. I was really looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Um, okay, you've disappeared. I can't see you, but um, are you still there? I am still here. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, I can hear you. We just can't see you. So I assume you'll appear at some point. There you are. Thank you. I'm here. Um, great. So we are ready for student questions. Chelsea, I see your hand is raised. Please go ahead. Erica, thank you so much. This was really interesting, so important to think about, and also like in public health, this is happening all the time. Um, I was wondering for you, was there anything that you found that was like surprising or unexpected or something that really stuck with you in these findings? I think one thing that surprised me was that the, the results of people's opinions, particularly with regard to their comments, were similar between faculty and students. One might think that um, faculty, now that they are actually in the position of having to choose um, future students for matriculation, that they may have um, a swing one way or the other of maybe even towards um, expecting clinical experience, but many of those individuals, actually the majority of them, um, uh, that were negative comments came from faculty members. And so I think that the confusion lies more with students, um, although this would have to be teased out more, and faculty seem a little bit clearer on whether or not they, um, on what types of experiences are required, but still lean towards heavily that they, have, they require this. And when you consider that certain um, professional fields do not have a particular requirement, let's say the law field, of working in that particular field before going to that school, I think it's remarkable that medical schools still have this very strong cultural component, um, despite all of the application breadth that's available to them to review a, a student's fit for medical school. Great, thank you for responding to that. Thank you for that question, Kelsey. Um, we have a question from Steve who says, very nice presentation. Uh, your results are concerning both uh, sorry, your results are concerning both the STMM marketing and the disconnect and variability in medical school messaging seems like a clear problem. What do you think are appropriate next steps, especially since medical schools were reluctant to participate, uh, share, part, to par participate, share their admissions criteria? Indeed, um, the uh, schools were very reluctant. Um, many people skipped the question of whether or not the school had a rubric of what, what criteria to follow. And for those who said there was a rubric, um, it wasn't clear if that was even followed. Um, so, you know, relying on the schools themselves where there seems to be a disconnect between the individual um, feelings about STMM participation in students and the way that the school actually advertises its expectations with regard to having prior clinical experience, they don't match up. They didn't match up in this study with even the sample size we had. I think that the, a better place to go because schools may be reluctant to participate. The most reason, uh, common reason people did not participate was survey fatigue of students. They did not want to distribute yet another survey to students. And so that was the most common reason people um, did not participate. But I think this needs to be led from higher up, from the regulatory agency itself. The AAMC needs to take a step. And if they're going to go ahead and publish um, recommendations for students on what schools in general expect from accredited institutions, this needs to be placed from their end. Schools will naturally follow this because they want to maintain their, their status um, within the United States. Um, they are regulated by the AAMC. And um, I, I chose uh, allopathic schools for consideration, not because uh, DO schools do not have this, or doctors of osteopathy schools don't have this phenomenon occur, but because of the, the fact that they must report all of their, their enrollment findings and other information to the AAMC while it's optional for DO schools at this time. 
And so it was easier to compare like with like, so to speak, um, to get more information from the AAMC and the connection between the AAMC and those schools um, for this study. But I, um, that is also another issue is that a good proportion of medical schools in the United States were not conclude, included in this, uh, in this study. Wonderful, thank you for that really thorough response, Erica. Uh, you've got a lot of congratulations to read through in the chat, so I hope you take a minute to look at those. Um, so that's all the time that we have for your presentation. Thank you so much once again. Thank you. Um, so with that being said, um, we're gonna move to Sonora. Sonora, uh, thank you for being here. Let me spotlight you and uh, please go ahead. Great. Thank you so much. Can everybody see the slides correctly and hear me okay? Yes. Great. Um, so my name is Sonora Stampley and today I'll be presenting on the acceptability of direct to pharmacy pathways to improve the efficiency of prep delivery in Kenya. Uh, a note on my positionality, um, while I do have experience in East Africa and have collaborated with Kenyans um, for a few years, I've not done direct field work there. I do not have a clinical background, which does impact my role in this study, which was doing a quantitative analysis of provider survey results. For a bit of background, PrEP or pre-exposure prophylaxis is a really highly effective medication at preventing HIV infection. Uh, HIV prevalence in Kenya is currently 4.2%, and Kenya was the first country in Africa to launch a national PrEP campaign to combat the HIV AIDS epidemic there. Um, and initiation on PrEP has been quite high in Kenya. Currently, there's more than 150,000 people that have initiated PrEP, um, but to continue to address the UNAIDS goal of no new infections by 2030, we need to continue focusing on retentions and different methods of offering PrEP. Um, so there's a little bit of an opportunity gap here. There's a lot of lessons we can learn from HIV treatment delivery in this setting. Um, there's also been a lot of research on the specific challenges to PrEP delivery. Um, at the user level, we see that wait times, visit frequency, and, and stigma that's associated with HIV and AIDS creates challenges. Um, offering PrEP was also added onto an existing workload for providers. Um, so that's continued to tax an already overburdened system. But within these challenges, there are opportunities um, for increased efficiency, diminished client burden, reducing the workload, and improving clinical outcomes. And those were the goals of the Efficiency Project, which was a quasi-experimental study led by Kenneth Maguanya. He's looking at improving PrEP efficiency in Kenya um, through uh, offering two differentiated delivery approaches. And a differentiated delivery approach is just a client-centered or patient-centered approach to care. Um, the two in particular examined were direct-to-pharmacy PrEP refills. So instead of having to go to a standard clinic visit, someone seeking PrEP could go straight to the pharmacy. Um, and they also offered the option of HIV self-testing. So while a client was waiting to pick up their PrEP, they could do a self-administered swab or, or finger prick to do a blood test and bring their negative results with them to the pharmacy to pick up their medication. Um, the study also looked at patient and provider perceptions and experiences of these different uh, delivery models. And that is where my study is nested within. Um, I looked at um, the evaluation and assessment of the differences in acceptability, appropriateness, and feasibility of these two models amongst providers. Um, so this was a cross-sectional survey conducted at two public health facilities with established prep, prep programs in central Kenya. Our population that we targeted was healthcare providers at these participating clinics. Um, and we really tried to get a representative sample of all types of healthcare providers, um, but no sample size calculation was, con calcu was calculated for this particularly. Um, this does limit our generalizability and the power of this study, but we do feel like these findings do reflect um, what is happening at these, in these specific clinical settings. The survey itself was um, modeled after, after the Proctor et al. framework for early implementation outcomes. The first outcome we looked at as defined by Proctor is acceptability, which is the perception that a given innovation is agreeable in a particular setting, appropriateness, which is the perceived fit of that kind of intervention, and feasibility, which is the extent to which a new innovation can be successfully used or carried out within a given setting. 
So given those definitions in that framework, we use the tool uh, um, of structured validated questionnaires put forth by Weiner et al. that use these same three early implementation outcomes. The questionnaire itself is brief. It's, it's not disease or context specific. And there are 24 total questions, four within each of these early implementation outcomes. Um, and they were all assessed on a five point Likert scale. Surveys were proctored in person and then entered into REDCap by study staff on site in Kenya. For the analytic approach, we again are looking at those three primary outcomes. We did separate analyses for both differentiated care models. And then within each of these primary outcomes, we took the four question items and averaged them together to create a multi-scale outcome. Descriptive statistics and ANOVA testing were conducted in R. Five minutes. Okay. Um, so onto the results. Uh, we had 145 providers participate in the survey overall. The majority were female. We had relatively um, equal representation across both clinic sites. And we collected data on six different healthcare cadres. Um, there were seven on the initial survey, but Due to a really small number of doctors and clinical officers and the similarity in, um, in function, we've consolidated that to the line item of clinician here. Uh, we kind of collected information on the duration of work and binned it in a way that was meaningful to the clinical settings at less than a year, one to three years, and more than three years. Um, and the majority, vast majority of people had been directly involved in prep delivery. So um, our results for the direct-to-pharmacy pathway, um, across all three outcomes, we saw really large amount of agreeability. On our five-point scale, four is agree and five is completely agree. And you can see here that the mean response for our multi-scale outcomes are all around 4.2. Um, our interquartile ranges, again, start at four. So you can imagine that the vast majority of people are, are responding agree or completely agree uh, to these questions. Uh, we see similar, uh, similar responses across the HIV self-testing aims as well. There's a slightly lower interquartile range for the acceptability questions. Um, but again, our means are still around 4.2, indicating that people have strong agreement for these interventions. We then conducted one-way analysis of variance for these different um, outcomes by pr provider characteristic. And we did find significant difference in mean outcomes by clinic, healthcare worker cadre, and duration. Um, we, we have some hypotheses as to why this is occurring from other data we've gathered um, throughout the implementation of this intervention. One of our clinics had some initial hesitancy by their pharmacy team to implement these, um, implement this intervention. Um, so that is why we're, we we're seeing a difference in clinical response. Um, among healthcare workers, we saw that nurses and uh, counselors were slightly more hesitant. Um, and we hypothesized that this might be the result of concerns about task shifting as they had previously been the ones um, conducting the work that would have then been, been eliminated through these direct to pharmacy refills. Um, and last we saw that work, those who had worked longer had a slightly more um, less, less agreement than, than other cadres, which was surprising. Sex and involvement with prep delivery did not show any statistical significance in difference. Two minutes. So some of the limitations of the study are general, generalizability, as I mentioned before. This was a cross-sectional survey only done at one point in time near the beginning of the intervention. So we can't, didn't capture any changes in attitudes over time. Uh, there's the potential for response bias. Uh, and we don't have linkage to individual outcomes at this time. Uh, there is the potential to link these outcomes to clinical level prep adherence um, in future analyses. And lastly, we did not collect the age of providers. Um, we know from other studies that the age of a provider is particularly important when considering prep delivery to adolescent girls and young women. Um, so that's a limitation. Uh, the patient population of these clinics tend to be those that are over 30. So we don't think it had a huge impact here, but would be important to include for future work. So in conclusion, HIV self-testing and directive pharmacy refills are really widely viewed as acceptable by a range of providers. Uh, statistically significant variance in agreement 
has some implications for future organizational readiness and, and conducting targeted communications with folks when considering task shifting interventions. As a next step, we'll be looking at uh, outcomes and, and multiple characteristics and the interactions between different um, key characteristics of provider. And with that, I would like to um, say some thank yous to the participants, uh, the study team, Nelly, Mugo, Kenneth, and Winnie, um, our funders, my committee members, Kenneth Mugwanya and Jen Ross, and, and the Caesar Center for their R support. And with that, I'm happy to take questions. Good job, thank you. Thank you so much for that amazing presentation. Um, any questions for Sonora? Good, congratulations for coming question. in. Okay, sure, go ahead. Is that Chelsea? I can't yes. tell. Okay, yes, Chelsea. Right, Chelsea. Um, great work, Sonora, really amazing. Yes, great, our studio skills. Um, obviously, 10 minutes is a short time. Was there anything that maybe you didn't have time to present on that um, you wanted to share or include and speak on now? A great question. 10 minutes does go really fast. Um, I know something that I was talking uh, with, with Kenneth, who's led this study um, for a long time yesterday, was the implications for future work. Um, you know, I think something that surprised me was just the overwhelmingly positive response um, by providers of all types to these interventions. You know, we were looking for differences so we could look at areas for future improvement, but um, Knowing that this is so widely accepted, I think thinking about how to engage with the Ministry of Health and counties in Kenya moving forward would be an interesting aspect um, so we can think about future scale up of this type of work. Thank you for your question. Wow, you were really thorough that everyone understands <laughs> everything you said, so there are no questions, okay. There's one from Azalea who says, uh, great job, Nora. Do you have any data on previous acceptability so you could compare over time? Um, not from this specific data set. And as the study was initially outlined, it was just, the survey was just gonna be conducted once. The, um, there is the possibility of conducting it a second time, but knowing that it's so positive, I don't know that we would see that much change, at least at these two clinical settings. Were, were this to be implemented elsewhere, it may be interesting to look um, at more pre-post type information or pre-post survey information. Great. And there's one from Barbara who says also great job. Would you know if how the healthcare worker would link the negative result to the person presenting for PrEP? Yeah, so in, in this intervention, um, I, and if I'm understanding the question correctly, when a patient going for PrEP um, is uh, at the pharmacy, basically they've already had an initial consult. So they're going for a refill. So they have an established medical record. Um, and when they're arriving at the pharmacy, there um, are helpers on site. So they are given the option to take their rapid test. Um, and I believe they bring it themselves to the presenter, but if they have any questions at any time, they can ask um, for assistance. They also have the option to do the standard flow of care at any time and can uh, opt in to doing uh, a clinical, a normal clinical, standard clinical visit. Does that answer your question? Okay. Looks like it did. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you so much. If anyone has any additional questions for Sonora, please don't hesitate to uh, place it in the chat box and I'll try to keep an eye out, let Sonora know to answer that publicly. Sonora, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. So next up is Horatio. Horatio, I see you're here on the line. Um, let's highlight you so we can all see you. Um, all right, are you ready to share? Hi everyone, can you hear me and watch my screen? Yes, we can hear and see you. Please go ahead. Great, so thank you for being here today. 
I will be presenting my MPH thesis work called Identifying Drivers of Spatial Temporal Heterogeneity in COVID-19 Outcomes During the 2020-21 Outbreaks in Peru. I want to thank my thesis committee, Bobby Reiner, Alran Flaxman, and Jose Manuel Magallanes. First, I want to talk about my positionality. I was born and lived in Peru until 2020, March 2021, white and Latino. As a physician, I telemonitored COVID-19 patients at the beginning of the pandemic. Here also my roles, uh, specific roles in the project, and I want to dedicate this thesis work to all families in Peru that were affected by COVID, and particularly to those that lost a relative. To set the research in context, we have to go back to 2019. In the 2019 GBD report indicated uh, Peru was the country with the lowest all costs related disability adjusted life years rates in Latin America and the Caribbean. So Peru was supposed to be a country with relative low disease burden compared to other countries in Latin America and the Caribbean. However, during the pandemic, things changed completely. The World Health Organization reports that Peru had the highest per capita excess mortality rate for the 20 to, to 20, 21 period from all countries in the world. So this outlier here, that is Peru with 437 excess deaths associated with COVID-19 per 100 individuals. So the idea behind the thesis was to understand what happened in Peru was to understand what drivers determine better or worse outcomes in the Peruvian settings, particularly at the provincial level. Some authors have suggested some reasons why Peru did so poorly. Among these, their inequality, weak health system, the high percentage of informal workforce, and the lack of social protection. So to go into the methods of how I try to answer these questions, I use the Peruvian vital registration system as the main data source, subsetting by only COVID-19 deaths. It includes patient level entries that were aggregated to weekly and provincial observed mortality rates. So Peru administratively, to get in context, is composed of units called departments at the first level and provinces at the second administrative level. And we obtained information for all of the 196 provinces and that are distributed, as you can see in this map here. The period that we chose for the mortality information was from March 2020 to June 2021, which was before the vaccination for the general population started. The data included uh, information of around 189,000 deaths. We included other data sources to obtain province level covariates like the Peruvian census uh, for population size, density, demographic structure. And we try to use the social security insurance as a proxy for informality in the Peruvian setting. We use also the United Nations Human Development Index, which is a composite indicator of life expectancy, education, and income. We also obtained estimates uh, from a collaborator in Peru of estimates of internal migration um, during the pandemic that could have contributed to countrywide transmission. And finally, we extracted, extracted other covariates that are listed here. So the analytic approach that we took had three main steps. First, we used the meta regression, Bayesian regularized and trimmed, also known as Mr. Bird mixed effect model, together with a cascading spline approach. We modeled uh, province level mortality data in um, where the dependent variable was the weekly mortality rate and the predictor uh, was time in weeks. The resulting output from this uh, was a, a province level time varying weekly mortality rates. Here in the right, we can see an example of a process for a set of provinces belonging to a particular department. The cascading split was first fit uh, uh, fitted a mortality curve for the country. And that cascading spline model was used as a prior for the departmental level fit. And finally, the departmental level fit was used as a prior for the province level estimates. This last step was vital for provinces with high standard error and few data points as it enables to borrow strength from higher level and neighboring provinces. The next step was to extract epidemic features 
For this, the transmission features were estimated using the mortality rate and the time varying inf uh, infection fatality ratio, obtaining incident cases with that, and then we obtain the uh, effective reproductive number. And finally, we extracted an, the highest initial reproductive number for that particular provinces. We also uh, calculated mortality features by identifying the highest peaks in the first and the second wave. So in this graph to the right, we can see uh, the highest RT uh, for a particular province, and also in this graph correlated graph here, we can see that particular mortality peak for that same province uh, in two cases for the first and the second wave. The last step of the analysis was to use the extracted epidemic features at the province level to identify the relationship between individual and multiple drivers of transmission. So to guide this uh, data exploration and covariate selection, we started with a principal component analysis to identify which covariates were collinear and explain the variability in the different features. Now we're talking about a little bit about the spatial results. Um, we have maps from the transmission rates and the mortality. So the first map shows where the first mortality peak occurred, mainly as we can see in the Northeast or Amazon jungle and the North coast of Peru. So the mortality rate for the first peak had a similar pattern as this graph here. Um, the day of the second peak also happened in the first, uh, first in the Amazon jungle of Peru. However, the intensity of the second peak was uh, not as intense uh, in the Amazon jungle and was highest um, in the Andes and the coastal regions of Peru. This is the principal component analysis. So this plus the first against the second principal components and both of which explains around 60% of the variability in the covariates that we chose. Every covariate is represented as a vector in this graph. So depending on the length and direction of the vector, the covariates are related to each other and the outcomes. For example, and this is important to understand, we can interpret these three covariates here, the human development index, years of education and social security insurance, which are covariates related to wealth and sociodemographic status and are the drivers of the principal component number one. On the other side, we see these uh, two covariates here, the proportion of 65 and older, and the proportion of female, which are the drivers of the second principal component. Flat. As seen in the previous slide, we can plot this principal component, number one, which is supposed to be the sociodemographic construct and against the different peaks mortality. And we can see a clear linear relationship between both every single point in this graph is a province and the size is related to the population size. That same relationship can be observed uh, by plotting the human development index against the mortality peaks, which in simple terms mean that for both ways, the wealthier the province, the higher the mortality. Here we have two plots, plots five and six, we plot the principal component two, which entail demographic structure of the provinces. And we observe no relationship in the first wave, but we see an inverse relationship for the second wave. Here in the plot seven and eight, we see that mortality in the second wave was worse in provinces uh, with a higher percentage of elderly people, but this did not happen during the second wave. So it's important to question us, could be related to more relaxation of society uh, during the second wave. And finally, we explore the relationship between incoming migration and mortality during the first and second wave. This is important because we wanted to understand how they interacted with the wealthy of wealthiness of a province. So, and we saw a linear relationship a little bit stronger in the second wave between internal migration and mortality only for the poorest half of the provinces. That means that, that the more incoming migration that the province received, the highest mortality, and only for less wealthy provinces. As a final remarks of my findings, we found that transmission and intensity of the outbreaks uh, had differentiated patterns between waves one and two. Additionally, we have so far identified three main drivers of the variability of COVID-19 outcomes at the provincial level. The overall wealth of the province, the demographic structure, uh, and the internal migration. 
from the beginning, uh, this research did not pursue to directly answer why such terrible outcomes occurred in Peru, but instead we, ser we searched to understand what happened using a magnifying lens to the patterns of mortality and transmission. And basically these results bring new questions of what happened in Peru, uh, but understanding Peru as an example of a fi failed COVID-19 response is a valuable and tragic lesson for global health that we plan to further dissect and analyze. So just to mention two limitations before going further and finalizing that we have limitations. We assume similar under reporting for all provinces. Also, this is an ecological study and that will be all because I went over time. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Horatio. That was amazing. Um, any questions for him? I see a lot of... Okay, great. Chelsea, please start us off. Uh, so many, yeah, so many great um, things. Thank you so much, Horacio. And, and thanks, I'm sure this was like a very heart heavy study as well for you. Um, so I was just wondering, I know you saw, had some of those different outcome drivers, but in your work, did you see anything around how indigenous and or rural communities within Peru, um, like any disparities and how that was impacted? Sadly, at the provincial level, that is not feasible to, to assess right now. Um, but there are reports of how indigenous communities in Peru were hardly hit during the pandemic. For the purpose of this study, because it's an ecological study at the provincial level, uh, we could not assess that part, but it's definitely something that I would really like to look further into the future. Great, thank you. So I've got a couple student questions from you. Okay, so one from Azalea who says, nice job. Uh, do you have any hypothesis for why Peru's outcomes exceeded other countries in Latin America, assuming similar trends would be observed in other countries? I still think that the informality, I, I think, and I, we tried to measure informality with a proxy that was social security insurance, which is how many, how, what percentage of the population had a formal job. But as I showed in the PCA, that was completely collinear with the wealth and the human development index. So I did not take that covariate, but we hypothesized that there must be another informality or a structure of how the social dynamics in Peru occurred, and mostly in wealthier provinces where there are more uh, mobility that could have explained this. I think I need more covariates. I need to extract more data in order to find that. But I think one of the reasons was the weak health system that we had. Uh, and the second one is the informal workforce because 70% of the Peruvian workforce is uh, informal. That means that even though you had lockdowns, people needed to go to the street to uh, make their living uh, on a day to day. Great, thank you. And let's take our final question from Steve who also says great, uh, great presentation, important work. In 2019, the Gates Ventures and Exemplars project identified Peru as one of the handful, handful of global models of excellent health outcomes based on low stunting uh, U5MR. Uh, did they get anything wrong? And if so, what? And then second part to it is, wouldn't the HDI and inequalities and migrations also show up as drivers of the health indicators? Well, I hope you I, understood that because I didn't understand. I, I understand the first one maybe, but regarding the first one, I think there, there were tailored interventions in Peru during the 90s and the 2000s that reduced mortality, under five mortality and maternal outcomes. And that is a reality for Peru, even though the comprehensiveness and um, how the robustness of the Peruvian health system is still really bad or to find, try to find a word like it's, I think, I don't think that they get that wrong. I, I was in that presentation, so I remember completely, but um, but I think other aspects or, or, or components of the health system were so weak or so 
uh, badly interconnected that COVID-19 broke some of these cracks that our health system had. And for the second one, I, I, I think I didn't understand that question. Uh, Steve, in three seconds, can you ask your question or type it in the chat and let Horatio get to it? Well, uh, just that the, uh, the things you mentioned, the HDI inequalities and migration should be drivers of other health uh, indicators. I mean, they should make the health worse, not just for COVID. And so I guess my question is that these are HDI inequalities and migration were around before. Um, so how does Peru become this model of great healthcare when you have some of these uh, major problems existing? The HDI was a constant because that was a base, uh, a base state before, before the pandemic, but the migration, internal migration is an exodus that happened during the pandemic. So during the pandemic, this exodus of people moved from the capital to Lima to other places of the country because they had no work. And they, this probably predisposed uh, some transmission dynamics uh, that, uh, um, that uh, uh, go went to all over the country. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much for that really, really thorough presentation. That was amazing. Also, to audience, if you have any more questions, please add it in the chat box. Thank you, Horatio. Um, all right. So next up is Jared. Um, Jared, I see you. I will spotlight you and uh, please share your screen. Okay, give me just one second to get it shared. Are you guys able to hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Let's get this full screen. Okay, and does everything look full screen? Yep, yeah, looks okay. good. Cool, thanks, Nora. Um, and thanks everyone for being here. Um, my name is Jared and I'm gonna be presenting health needs assessment for queer women, non-binary and transgender people in Seattle, Washington. Um, I also just wanted to, acknowledge my thesis committee, my chair, Keshet Ronan, and my committee member, James Pfeiffer. Um, and to just lay out the roadmap for my presentation, I'll talk about my background methods, preliminary results, both quantitative and qualitative, um, and then the discussion, and um, then the more sort of expanded version of my acknowledgements. Um, so in terms of background, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, and queer people face discrimination at multiple levels, systemic, structural, and interpersonal. In terms of the systemic level, 71% of countries criminalize private consensual same-sex activity between men, 43 countries between women. And in terms of structural, um, LGBTQ people in general face reduced access to health services compared to their peers. Um, and there are also policy restrictions against gender affirming care for transgender children and transgender people um, in some states around the United States. Um, and then in terms of interpersonal, 57% of LGBTQ adults in the United States have been the target of slurs and 51% the target of violence. So, um, yeah, and then wait for me. in terms uh, of I'm health, in, oh, sorry, I think somebody might be on Don't wait for me. Um, right, yes. Uh, whoever's on the line who's not shared, please uh, mute yourself. <laughs> Thanks, Nora. Sorry, um, go ahead. No, no problem at all. Um, and then in terms of health impacts that um, these different levels of discrimination cause, 18% um, of LGBTQ people report avoiding healthcare encounters due to concern about being discriminated against in the clinical context. And that number increases to 22% among transgender people. Um, and you know, what I really wanna highlight in this study is that people who experience discrimination um, under the you know, identities of, of their sexuality or gender also experience overlapping discriminations based on race, based on socioeconomic status um, and based on, you know, the other isms that we've talked a lot about in our program, um, racism and classism. And so um, I've really kind of used intersectional theory to frame the types of overlapping discrimination that these different um, folks have faced depending on the intersections that they occupy. Um, so my study really aims to address two primary research gaps. The first being that research tends to lump LGBTQ people together as a single group, despite the different types of discrimination faced by each of those queer identities, depending on the intersections. And then research also tends to focus on queer people only when that research pertains to diseases that have been sort of historically associated with sexual behavior like HIV or STDs. But there's been much more focus on cisgender, um, gay, bisexual men, and on other men who have sex with men, and much less focus on queer identities um, that 
are women or non-binary transgender people. And so those are the gaps that I hope to address. Um, so the purpose of the study was to assess the relative importance of queer health needs among LBTQ women and non-binary people in Seattle King County, Washington, to examine the differences across different intersections of queerness in terms of those um, experiences of um, you know, discrimination and to evaluate the barriers that um, these different identities experience when trying to access health services. And then also to address the need for increased research um, on queer health outside of the context of traditionally queer associated diseases. And so um, my methods, um, this is a mixed method study with a qual-quant exploratory approach. My quantitative survey um, results include N376 and the qualitative semi-structured focus groups include N27 participants. Um, the study was conducted through partnership with Gay City, who was um, interested in conducting this research to inform a health service expansion. Um, and then the recruitment approach was multi-pronged strategy, including emails to listservs, online flyers, print flyers at community venues, and in-person outreach at Seattle Trans Pride. Um, my quantitative methods um, included, again, the, the cross-sectional survey. That survey was an online-based survey, and it was red cap based. Um, and then data collection occurred between June 22nd of 2018 and September 28th of 2018. And then the analysis was conducted in R. And the constructs that we measured included basic demographic information, gender identity, sexuality, annual household income, in, um, health insurance status. And then we also evaluated the um, relative importance of health needs and then healthcare satisfaction and barriers to care. Um, and then the qualitative methods um, included a focus group of participants from the survey that were willing to extend their participation into a focus group discussion. Um, and it included a dual deductive and inductive coding process um, where the two code books were collapsed um, and then double coded to find themes. And then to highlight my results, my sample was fairly young um, compared to the population in Seattle with a median age of 28 um, and predominantly Caucasian, 85% of the sample was Caucasian. Um, and then the annual household income of participants, about half of the sample had a household income of less than $45,000 a year. 5% um, or almost 6% of the sample was uninsured. 26% um, was publicly insured and then 66% were privately insured. And in Five terms minutes. of, thanks Nora. And then in terms of gender and sexuality, um, we feel that we have a pretty good distribution of different um, sex and gender and sexuality identities across the sample. 53% of the sample identified as cis women. Um, and then 5% of the sample identified as trans women or, um, and then rather 7.2% identify as trans men. And then 25% of the sample was gender queer and non-binary. Um, and then in terms of sexuality, 27% um, of the sample identified as lesbian and 22% of the sample identified as bisexual, um, and then 36% of the sample identified as queer. Note that these were select multiples, so people could select more than one identity that they aligned with. And then in terms of the ranking of health needs, um, the analysis here was based on um, a Likert type item that asked um, for participants to rank their top 10 health needs. So the N is different for each of these, depending on how many people selected that need as important. So I think I'm gonna need to actually conduct a secondary analysis on this to better understand um, you know, the significance of the different number of contributors to each of these means. But um, based on the current analysis, we found that acupuncture and specialist care were two of the um, most highly needed services. Um, and also um, this need for different services sort of across the spectrum of care was kind of similar and high. So um, you know, there's definitely a lot of unmet health need across the population and sample. Um, and then these are the quantitative analysis analyses that are ongoing. Um, I'm doing an analysis to better understand barriers to care based on care category, um, an analysis to understand the degree of satisfaction based on each care category, and also an analysis of difference by groups, both by gender, sexuality, trans versus cis identity, BIPOC versus white, um, younger, middle and older age, um, and then education status, um, insurance status, and income. And then my qualitative thematic analysis identified three themes. The first was care contingencies as a barrier to health. The second was that insufficient insurance coverage and care access um, was a problem, especially for low middle income people. And theme three was that there is trouble building lasting trust within 
um, the clinical context, both with clinical professionals and with health systems. And I've got one quote to um, sort of, you know, encapsulate each theme here. So my quote for the care contingencies theme um, is that a lot of insurance companies don't cover dental. And I know a lot of people, at least two of my friends that couldn't get gender affirming surgery because they had very severe problems with their teeth that had to be taken care of before they could go under. And they couldn't get that taken care of because dental is not covered. For theme two, um, insufficient insurance coverage, um, the quote that I've selected is, I spent about 10 years of my life trying to find a dentist who could afford who I could afford and that would take me. Um, I'm quote lucky in the sense that I'm just low enough income where I can go to a public dental clinic. But some of my friends are in that nasty little spot where it's like they don't make enough to get dental insurance, but they don't make so little that they can go where I go. And so a lot of them are just going without and that's not great. Two minutes. Thanks, Nora. And then for theme three, trouble building lasting trust with clinical professionals and systems. Um, I've quoted participant one who said, I didn't feel like I could form a meaningful relationship. And I also just spent the first few sessions explaining my queerness and my being intersex. So there was a lot of groundwork I had to do to sort of educate who I was working with. So more um, generally thinking about the intersex community, not that I'm a spokesperson, but a lot of us carry specific traumas around medical spaces. So seeing a therapist can really be challenging for a lot of people. And we have to do the work of educating people about what it means to be an intersex person who's experienced trauma it's a constant reinvoking of the experience that we've had to go through in a context that isn't always therapeutic. And then um, in terms of my discussion, I think that this study contributes an improved understanding of queer health needs and an improved understanding of barriers to queer health. Um, I think that the, strength is, the strengths of the study include its mixed methods approach and the fact that it has an adequate sample size for the questions that we're interested in asking for this exploratory study. Um, I think that the limitations are that the sample really lacks racial diversity and that the sample may be skewed too young to be fully representative of the Seattle King County queer community as a whole. Um, and I just wanted to again acknowledge my thesis committee and our partner Gay City um, and also my other UW mentors Steve Lloyd, Amy um, Hagopian and Todd Fabian. Um, and thanks to my family and friends and peers in the program too for all of your support and I'll take any questions. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jared. That was that was really, really nice. Um, any questions for Jared? It's a lot of clapping. All right, Sonora, please go ahead. Excellent work, Jared, and very nice presentation. I know these are just early findings, but it seems like you may have some implications for provider training moving forward. Curious if you have any thoughts on that just based on your, um, your initial review of, of results. Yeah, thanks for your question. I uh, would agree, like my results are preliminary, but my early ideas um, about that are um, to really you know expand diversity training beyond just um, unconscious bias training and to start talking about the particular populations that clinicians are gonna have to interact with in a more targeted way. Um, because I think what we've seen based on this analysis of intersectionality across queer identities is that you know, different groups have different needs that are really specific to those intersections that they occupy. And so I think that you know, clinicians need to understand that when they're trying to provide care to those people. Wonderful, Fatima, please. Thank you so much, Jared. That was a really excellent presentation. Um, my question for you is in regards to the um, lack of racial diversity, do you have any sort of hypotheses as to why that is? Um, were they not like, were more like people of color or BIPOC communities not aware of the study or were there like other reasons? You know, I think based on our approach to recruitment, which was pretty broad and multi-pronged that it probably wasn't a lack of awareness about the study. But I think that, you know, part of the issue is that Seattle um, does have a predominantly Caucasian LGBTQ population. So that definitely, you know, aligns to a degree with what we would see across, you know, the population in the area that we were sampling. Um, I think part of it too, though, goes back to this issue of like the difficulty of building trust with health systems um, to go back to this quote really quickly. Um, you know, I think that because um, people of color occupy, you know, intersections that result in different types of discrimination being added on top of the discrimination that they experience as a result of their queerness, that they're more reluctant to participate 
in research, just like they're more reluctant to seek health services. Um, and so I think that that really might be part of the problem here. So, you know, that's definitely an uh, area for further work is to figure out how to get these populations better engaged in our research. Great, any, um, any final questions for Jared before we move on? I actually have a question for you, Jared. I'm curious if you have any plans for this for this work. Like, I feel like it can't really end here. Um, do you have any plans for passing it along? Is is uh, Gay City going to do anything with this? Like, what are your plans to continue this work? Yeah, well, I'm definitely planning on reporting out to Gay City once the you know full version of the findings are available. I think that the other thing that I've started to think a lot more about is. Um, you know, the importance of having studies that try to measure all of these different identities at the same time so that we're not um, capturing only like a component of intersectionality in one study sample, but we're really being more broad and capturing more of those identities because I think it will help us better understand, you know, the differences between these groups. Of course, that's also going to require, you know, studies with larger sample sizes and broader sampling scopes. So I think that might be one of the next steps. And yeah, thank you for your question, Nora. Great. Yeah, well, I hope you get to share this with different communities so that they can kind of pass this on and it just becomes a baton that gets passed around and, and worked on. So, yeah. um, well, thank you so much. I'm going to end it here. Thank you for that presentation. And um, next up is Emma. Um, Emma, are, I know you're here. Okay, there you are. Um, okay, great. Can everyone see my slides? Yes, we can. Awesome. So thank you and welcome everyone. Um, as I said, my name is Emma Murphy and I'm going to be presenting today on a mixed method study looking at factors influencing participation in SGH surveillance activities. Um, so before I want to begin, um, I just want to begin by acknowledging that many people in the DRoom 3 team contributed to this study, not the least of whom are my thesis committee, Ariana and Judd. Um, I also want to recognize the major contributions of our colleagues in Benin, Muda, and Innocent. Um, you know, their expert knowledge about the local context was absolutely vital to this study, I think, in global health research globally, but then also specifically for qualitative analyses, you know, which rely on interpreting dialogue, reflect reflecting on one's positionality and how that um, influences the understanding one has of the data is crucial. Um, and I think their perspectives um, from the Benin team were really helpful in um, ensuring that that was a very intentional process. So um, a little context. Um, STH or soil transmitted health this is a group of intestinal parasites that cause adverse health effects outcomes in populations where these worms are endemic. Um, it's estimated to affect about 1.5 billion people globally. Health outcomes include diarrhea, anemia, and impaired development in children. Um, STH is also tied to adverse socioeconomic outcomes, which has effects on well-being across the lifespan. Currently, World Health Organization guidelines um, suggest annual mass drug administration of deworming medication, usually albendazole, to school-aged children and other key populations. Um, in lower middle income countries, this is largely done by school-based programming. However, there's current research and interest into understanding if more intensive deworming strategies can be used to interrupt transmission cycles and put countries on paths towards elimination. Um, the DWORM3 study, which is um, where my thesis is a uh, sub-analysis in, um, is one such trial testing the feasibility of transmission interruption by a community-wide uh, drug administration. So STH surveillance is a key portion of these programs. Um, it's essential to identify areas for programming and monitor progress. Um, and especially if countries take on a CMDA approach, it will be important for verifying transmission interruption. Um, STH surveillance current diagnostic techniques require a stool sample. So community members have to provide a sample of their feces, which as you can imagine, people have a variety of reactions to. So that brings us to the question that I looked at. Um, in, it's really asking, you know, what, 
what's the importance of looking at participation or in this case, non-participation in STH surveillance activities? Um, so this analysis was designed after observing variation in consent to provide a stool sample at baseline in Benin. Um, here you see the cluster level variation rates across the 40 DWORM3 um, study clusters for the baseline prevalence survey. Um, refusals range from 0.6% to 20%, so wide variation. And the concern here is that if certain geographies or certain groups of individuals are statistically less likely to provide a stool sample, then we could misidentify priority areas for programming and um, we could also bias data. So we proposed the following research aims. Using mixed methods, um, I aim to identify facilitators and barriers to participation in STH surveillance activities from the perspective of community members. To number two, identify determinants of participation at a population level. And lastly, to identify opportunities to improve STH surveillance programming. Data for this analysis was drawn from a baseline DWORM3 study in the Kome district of Benin. And just so we're all on the same page here, Benin is a country in West Africa and as highlighted on purple in the map. So onto methods. Um, I used an exploratory sequential design where the qualitative findings informed the quantitative analysis. The qualitative portion of this study includes six focus group discussions. We sampled men, women, and parents of children asked to participate from clusters which had high and then clusters which also had low refusal rates um, to be able to compare across different settings. Each focus group also included individuals who participated or provided a stool sample and individuals who refused. Um, the qualitative analysis was rooted in the theory of planned behavior. I conducted the primary coding, which was then validated by my colleague Innocent in Benin, and we co-developed case memos outlining salient themes. Our quantitative data set um, pulled from everyone invited to participate in the um, baseline prevalence survey, which included just over 7,000 individuals from just under 6,000 households. Our outcome of interest was provision of a stool sample at baseline, um, and we drew data on participant characteristics from two DWORM3 baseline surveys. Independent variables of interest um, were decided based on existing literature as well as the qualitative findings. We computed uh, descriptive statistics and built a mixed effects logistic regression model in which um, the cluster ID was a random effect. And we did this using a backward stepwise model building process. All right, on to the results. So this slide presents the main qualitative themes identified. Um, I'll discuss a few of them in detail. First, we found that individuals were weighing out the perceived benefits and risks associated with the provision of a stool sample to decide whether or not to give one. Interestingly, most of the benefits cited were at the community level, such as reduction of STH in the local population. Um, there was recognition that little individual benefit would be gained, but people were still willing to provide a sample for the good of their community. Here we see the words of one respondent who said, we agreed because intestinal worms destroy human health. It's a good project brought in. It's to help the population. That's why we agreed. Five minutes. Great. In contrast, most of the risks expressed were concerns people had for their individual well-being or that of their children. Respondents reported fear of their stool sample being misused, resulting in illness or even death. Um, and this belief was supported by circulating rumors, which is the second theme. Um, here we see the words of a female respondent who said they suspect that they will mysteriously disappear after they provide their stool samples. Um, the second quote highlights that these rumors were not just being passed um, in conversation, but were also circulating in social media and um, messaging platforms. Third theme, um, participants also reported that communication messages and the communication styles of the project agents collecting the stool samples also influenced their um, decision to participate. Focus group respondents noted that they were more likely to participate when collectors were patient in explaining the benefits of the program. Others reported negative interactions that led them to refuse to provide a sample, such as perceived impoliteness of agents or an inability on the agent's parts to accurately describe the program and the purpose. Lastly, there was a reduced aversion um, to handling the feces of children. Um, so as shown here, many stated that if it was a stool sample from a child that was asked for, it would be easier, whereas adult samples were um, somehow viewed as not okay. All right, onto the quantitative. So we looked at the influence of 12 variables on stool sample participation. Um, presented here is the final reduced model after our backward stepwise elimination um, process. So 
So to highlight a few of the results, um, first we see that adults were less likely to provide a stool sample than those under 15 years old. While not, not significant across categories, um, this aligns with some qualitative findings. Second, individuals from households who speak PEDA, one of the local languages, were um, more likely to provide a stool sample than those who spoke other languages. The PETA population are largely rural communities in this area in comparison to other language groups, which are more concentrated in urban areas of Kome. And so this finding actually aligns with the findings about population density, which suggest increasing population density is linked with a decreasing likelihood to provide a stool sample. Lastly, we found that length of residence and place of main residence influence participation. The longer someone has resided in their community, the more likely to provide a sample. Again, not significant um, statistically, but this aligns with quality of data that I'll discuss in a moment. Similarly, if someone has resided the majority of the days in the past six months prior to the survey um, in that particular community, they are more likely to participate or provide a sample. Okay, so before I conclude, I wanna highlight how the qualitative and quantitative data are working together here. We identified four areas of convergence. First, adults are less likely to provide a sample than children. Um, this was borne out in qualitative and quantitative data. Could be tied to cultural familiarity with tending to infants and small children or a familiarity with the school-based STH programs. Um, F focus groups um, respondents also expressed that prior experience with STH symptoms or a perception that STH affected their community increased their willingness to participate. This aligned with quantitative data that showed higher STH prevalence at the cluster level was linked with increased participation. Third, the qualitative data highlighted that an understanding of community level benefits was driving participation. Um, and the variables presented on the previous slide about length of time and place of main residence really kind of draw aspects about community affinity. So it could be that the more connected one feels with one's community, um, the more one is willing to do a rather unpleasant thing and provide a stool sample for the good of the community. Finally, we saw that the qualitative data showed the influence of rumors. And while further studies would need to be conducted to explore this further, um, we posit that densely populated urban areas um, perhaps facilitate the spread of rumors and misinformation. So that aligns with the quantitative data around population density. To conclude, um, our findings from this analysis highlight that a shift is needed in STH programming um, to provide participants with information to accurately assess, especially the individual risks, but also benefits of participating and providing a sample. And we need to stop assuming community level consent for surveillance activities. Um, this has implications for community engagement and communication strategies. Programs basically need to understand who's not participating, why, and invest in redesigning strategies to take those perspectives into account, which is largely something that's not currently done. I do wanna recognize that the study has limitations given its narrow geographic scope. So further exploration of these questions is definitely needed um, across different contexts. But ultimately the goal of STH surveillance is to have high representative participation. And otherwise, right, we could misidentify priority areas or bias data and our study found that individuals of certain groups were less likely to participate than others. So if STH surveillance is intensified for the purposes of um, transmission and elimination programming, then these questions um, about factors driving participation will really need to be considered. And with that, I will stop talking and take any questions you have. Great, thank you so much, Emma. That was amazing. I'm not surprised, so that was great. Um, any questions for Emma? I see some claps. Oh, come on. I know there's some good juicy questions out there. Great. Ariana, hi, please go ahead. Hi, Emma. Thanks. <laughs> Great job. The presentation is so excellent. Um, you spent a lot of time looking at recommendations that people provided about how to improve the programs. Um, and it's so interesting that you found like that, like basically social fabric and investment in community drives participation. And I wonder if any uh, recommendations came up about kind of how to engage those community level incentives. Um, uh, to increase participation. 
Yeah, um, thanks for that question. So yeah, the focus group discussions did ask for recommendations to improve programming. And some of the ones that I think were voiced that relate to what you're asking about um, were a suggestion to involve the local health facilities more um, to have their face be a part of the surveillance activities. Um, given that there was already existing trust between community members and um, the local health facilities. Similarly, people suggested using um, local community volunteers to do the collection sample. Um, there was also just a lot of emphasis placed on the sensitization that needs to be done on the ground before you walk into someone's house and ask for a stool sample. So thinking through things like community level meetings or how to engage with local leaders, um, those efforts, uh, those comments came through. Thank you. Um, anything else? You're definitely getting some some good jobs, some congratulations. Anything else? Claire, hi. Please go ahead. Emma, really, really, really great job. I'm so glad you got to work closely with the Benin team. They're really great. So, you know, dewarming is such an interesting topic and getting stool samples from people is really, really hard. And it's such a personal thing, like you're using the toilet, right? And a lot of people just see it as like a scientific element for the work. So I'm curious to hear from your perspective, how do you think about something that is scientifically necessary by making sure that you respect people's kind of autonomy and personal kind of behavior of doing something that is we do every day, but it's so personal to who we are as individuals? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, and I think this is something that uh, me and the rest of the team have really been discussing. And I think it's something that the field really needs to acknowledge and address, right? Like the asking for a stool sample uh, for the surveillance or for program monitoring is so often not given much thought or consideration. It's just like, oh yeah, we'll get stool samples from people. Great, move on. Um, because people are you know, focused on like the actual deworming intervention or the study or things like that. Um, but it is so personal and we do need to respect the autonomy of human beings to ask questions about, wait, why are you asking me of this? And how am I supposed to do this? And things like that. Um, one of the things I didn't share today, um, we did also collect data about people's experiences in the focus group uh, discussions, actually using the stool sample collection kit and recommendations they had to improve the design of that. So I think that could be a really interesting area for someone to explore further to, quarter, to incorporate aspects of human-centered design into the design of a stool sample kit to really make it less of a burden um, to, to take the sample. Um, but yeah, it's, it's something that I think the field needs to, to grapple with. So I really appreciate your question. Yeah, I totally agree. Really great answer. Thanks so much. Thank you. And with that, we are going to wrap your presentation. Thank you so much again, Emma, for your hard work. Of course. Thanks. And with that, um, Asha is our next uh, presenter. Asha, I'm going to highlight you. Oops, sorry. One second. All right, Asha, please share your screen. Great. Hello, everyone. My name is Ash Kadakia. Welcome to my capstone presentation. My capstone is entitled Barriers to Accessing Reproductive Health Services in Washington State as a Result of Catholic Health Systems Merging with Non-Catholic health, health Systems. My chair on this project is Dr. Beth Riven and Dr. Steve Goyd served on my capstone committee. I want to start off with discussing what Catholic hospital mergers are and why they matter in the current talk context. For the purposes of this project, mergers of Catholic hospitals refer to any mergers in which a religious or faith-based health system acquires or combines with a non-religious hospital and then uses a specific religious doctrine to set medical standards of care within their hospitals and their clinics. This commonly impacts or restricts healthcare and certain healthcare services. And since 2000, we have seen a steady increase around the country of mergers between public hospital systems and Catholic-based health institutions. 
And the reason that following these mergers is so important is because although these mergers happen for financial and economic reasons, the people who pay the price are patients because they often face very negative consequences when they try and access certain vital care. Now to dive into some general knowledge about Catholic hospital systems in this country, we'll start with the fact they're some of the largest, largest health systems in the United States. Out of the largest hospital systems in the US, Catholic hospital systems hold four out of the top seven spots. And as you can see from the graphic on the right from the ACLU Washington, one in six beds are in Catholic hospitals. And in Washington state in particular, over 50% of all hospital beds lie within Catholic hospital systems. In certain counties in Washington, this means the effect is more pronounced. After the most recent merger in Yakima County, the percentage of religiously affiliated hospital beds went from zero to 70%. I'd like to discuss something called ethical and religious directives or ERDs, which are the directives for Catholic health system providers in this country. They're discussed in a document put out by, US, by the US Conference of Catholic Bishops and that document is routinely updated with the most recent update in 2018. The ethical and religious directives provide a theological or faith-based explanation for the Catholic health ministries that operate within the United States. And these religious directives value religion over accepted medical standards of care, and within them, they prohibit and discuss why they prohibit multiple common reproductive health services, such as abortion, contraceptives, and more. A quote pulled from this document that summarizes this in the best way is that the church cannot provide medical practices that undermine the biological, psychological, and moral bonds on which the strength of the marriage and the family depends. So once again, this quote shows us that there's a preference of theology over medicine. Now to provide a visual representation of the percentage of hospital beds and Catholic institutions around the country, the ACLU has this wonderful graphic from 2019. So as you can see in the Pacific Northwest, both Washington and Oregon have some of the highest percentage of beds in Catholic hospital systems and many other states around the country have high numbers of religious, religiously affiliated hospital beds. Now I'd like to take some time to factor in how recent events on the news has affected this capstone and will affect the question that I've been looking to answer in my research. While I was writing this, in May, a leaked Supreme Court opinion in the pending SCOTUS case, Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization, was leaked to the public, and it would repeal the landmark Roe versus Wade case, and the impact of this leaked opinion is groundbreaking. There would be severe consequences for women and adolescents in at least 26 states where they would likely outlaw abortion outright. And if overturned, the decision about abortion would fall to the states. Now, to discuss how that might specifically impact Washington, Many are taking for granted that Washington state is a democratic state, and if given the choice, would not be, choose to take away the right of abortion. However, it's the problem of access that would increase. People from neighboring states or from around the country might seek out care in Washington, and given that religious hospitals are unwilling to provide these services, public hospital systems could be overburdened in providing this care, like the UW health system. Now to shift to my capstone project, the question that I tackled in my capstone is, what are the impacts on access to reproductive health care services when Catholic health systems merge with non-Catholic health systems in Washington state? And what can be done to protect access to reproductive health services? My capstone was in partnership with Uplift International, which is an international NGO based out of Seattle, Washington. And the mission of Uplift International is to work for justice and health for all individuals. Some of their current projects lie within the sectors of family planning, which includes access to abortion, ethics training for global health professionals, and partnering with local NGOs in order to maximize their potential for impact. My capstone in particular will culminate in a policy report for Uplift International, and the report will inform the already running human right to family planning initiative that is housed within the NGO. Now to run through some of my methods for this capstone project, I began with a thorough literature review, which particularly focused on NGO reports, newspaper articles, and academic journal articles that related to the topic of religious health systems and their impact on reproductive health care. And I gathered information from there. Once I gathered this information, I shifted my gears and began to reach out to professionals in the reproductive health field and the legal field and those who work at the interse intersection of both in order to try and set up an informational interviews. And the final step is drafting the policy report and in particular focusing on potential policy solutions for this issue. Five minutes. Thank you. Now I'd like to discuss some key findings from the project. The first is that the ERDs or the ethical and religious health directives value religious doctrine over standard practice medical care. Their justifications for denying certain healthcare services were rooted in faith and not in science. 
While some might believe that only access to abortion care is affected, there are several reproductive health services that are at, at risk, including access to birth control from hospital pharmacies and providers, contraceptive procedures such as an IUD implant, surgical sterilization, tubal ligation, or vasectomies, and fertility services such as IVF. These mergers are shown to affect access to essential services, which might violate certain state laws that protect reproductive rights of women in Washington. An additional finding is that Washington state law has protections in place for religious health institutions. It does not require any individual health provider or facility to provide a service that goes against their rel religious beliefs. However, as I stated previously, women have reproductive rights that are protected by the state. Through my research, I have found some ways in which states have put protections in place regarding mergers and for reproductive rights. In Oregon, there is HB 2362, which requires approval from the Department of Consumer and Business Services or the Oregon Health Authority for any mergers or affiliations of healthcare entities that take place. In Washington State in particular, there are certain laws that protect women's reproductive rights. One is the Reproductive Parity Act, which requires insurance plans to cover abortion services if they also cover other mental health services, or sorry, maternal health care services. In addition, the Protecting Patient, Pregnant Patient Act prevents a hospital from interfering with a professional's duty to provide a medically necessary care to pregnant patients whose lives are at risk. These laws are a good step in ensuring protections for reproductive health services in Washington. Now to shift to recommendations for this problem. The main recommendations is that mergers can occur, but the community should not lose access to the care that they've been provided before the merger took place. In addition, enforcement of the current laws like the Reproductive Parity Act and the Protecting Pregnant Patient Act should increase and accountability, accountability measures should be put in place for any institution that violates these laws. To monitor the impact of these mergers properly, funding for organizations that do this critical work should also increase. From my discussion with an ACLU legal counsel, I found that pursuing legal avenues that protect access is a more sustainable solution than focusing on dissolving mergers that have already taken place. And finally, there should be an educational campaign for the public in order to teach them about the current problem of limited access to reproductive care in Washington state. To conclude, I'd like to emphasize that we must improve protections for access to reproductive health care in Washington state. It is important to protect access to reproductive services in all health systems, both Catholic and non-Catholic health systems in Washington and around the country. And this capstone has demonstrated overall that this is a public health problem that should be uh, explored in further depth or in Washington and around the country. Thank you all so much for attending my presentation. I wanna give a special acknowledgement to Dr. Beth Riven, who is invaluable throughout this process. And she came with a wealth of knowledge and guided me throughout my entire capstone. I wanna give an additional shout out to Dr. Steve Boyd, who served on my committee and provided wonderful support. And lastly, a very, very important shout out to Leah Rutten, who is a lawyer at the ACLU Washington, who was one expert that I was referred to again and again, and who I interviewed and was very informative throughout this process and continues to do the good work on this issue. Thank you so much. That concludes my presentation. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Asha, for that really, really amazing presentation. Um, any questions for Asha? or her team. I know Beth is here. If there's any, anything you'd like to ask them as well. All right, so I see one question from Deka, who says amazing job. I did have one question. When did the most recent merger take place in Washington State? That's a great question. Uh, though, to my knowledge and research, the most recent uh, merger took place between Virginia Mason Health System and CHI for Siskin, which is a Catholic health institution. And this was finalized uh, just as recently as January 2021. So, um, and it had this uh, merger in particular actually is very important because before it occurred, um, the percentage of uh, religiously affiliated hospital beds in Washington was around 41%. And following this merger, it was bumped up to over 50. So it's it had a big impact on the state. Great. Um, let's see. So I see Amy has a question. Does the state's attorney general have any involvement in this problem? Um, from my knowledge, I think the state's attorney general would only have um, a role through laws or legal measures that are brought forth to them by organizations like the ACLU. 
Um, but I think if they were to try and prevent it, it would go against um, state law. And in order to try and dissolve any sort of merger, it would be a very, um, it would have to be like an antitrust breaking sort of situation. It would be very complicated, but um, I don't think at this moment they have a large role in, in these mergers. Great. Uh, there's a comment from Steve who says, excellent presentation. Uh, excellent background underscoring the importance of the ERDs issue in mergers of our hospital systems. And it and it's linked to the upcoming Roe versus Wade Supreme Court decision, a big deal. That was a comment from Steve. Um, I saw that there was a a uh, question from Ani, who says, nice job. Just wondering if it's only reproductive services that are affected by these mergers or if other services are affected as well. Um, that's a great question. It's not only reproductive health services. There's also implications on LGBTQ plus care, uh, such as uh, gender affirmation surgery, which is barred by the ERDs, and also um, euthanization or uh, the right for death is also affected by this. Thank you for the question. Great. Um, any final burning questions for Asha? And Beth says, yes, and end of life issues loom large. Yes. Comment from Beth. All right, well, Asha, thank you so much for wrapping us up in our second batch of uh, and capstone presentations. Thank you all for sticking around since almost 10 a.m. Um, so we're gonna move into a nice lunch break. Right now we're doing great on time. So please join us by 1.55, ideally two minutes before that for our next uh, and last session of the day. So the Zoom link will be the same. Please come back around 1.53-ish so we can get started at 1.55. Thank you all so much and I'll see you in uh, like 25 minutes. Thank you. All right, good to go. Great, hi everybody, welcome back from the break. Um, we're gonna resume our thesis presentations and next up is Maggie Walters. So take it away, Maggie. Great, great. Um, hi, my name is Maggie Walters, and I use she, her pronouns, and my thesis works to improve pediatric estimates of HIV in Brazil through the incorporation of empirical data. I'd like to thank MoiQ, Jeff Eaton, Alice, and Drake for serving on my thesis committee. Um, I wanted to acknowledge that I'm on the traditional land of the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish people past and present, and I honor with gratitude the land itself and the Duwamish tribe. I'd also like to acknowledge and honor those who live with and have died from HIV AIDS and those who continue to advocate on the beha behalf of those affected by HIV. Um, this includes people whose narratives are systematically excluded from health metrics research, such as individuals who are gender nonconforming and transgender. Where possible, I intend to use gender neutral language. However, some common terms are inherently gendered, such as maternal transmission. And the data included in this analysis upholds the gender binary. If you have any suggestions on alternative and more inclusive language, I would very much appreciate that being shared. Um, I analyze the data that's presented in this presentation, but I'm also very grateful to Deborah Malta for providing access to this data and for those in Brazil who uphold the country's strong disease reporting systems. Um, so to begin, I'll first situate this uh, presentation within the context of pediatric HIV transmission dynamics and the current modeling framework used to estimate burden for this age group. I'll then introduce my aims before describing my results and conclusions. The last decade has seen a large scale up in investments toward early infant diagnosis testing for HIV, which has dramatically increased the number of infants diagnosed with HIV, and from this, the number who are able to access treatment. As this data becomes more available, we have been able to identify areas for improvement to develop a more empirically driven model. In other words, a model whose estimates reflect data gathered through trials and experiments. Unfortunately, there is massive variation in the scale of early infant diagnosis testing, with some countries reporting 90% of HIV exposed infants being tested, while others report a much lower 30% coverage. Despite this, detailed data from adults living with HIV can still be integrated into the current modeling framework for pediatric HIV to improve estimates. 
Brazil offers a really rich data landscape to explore interesting modeling questions relevant to pediatric HIV transmission. And I'll provide a more thorough overview of these data sources in a later slide. Improving estimates of pediatric HIV burden allows policymakers and other stakeholders to identify the scale of misdiagnoses within the age group and to create programs and structure and infrastructure for access to treatment for this age group that has the potential to have the longest time dependent on treatment and access to healthcare. Um, the spectrum pediatric modeling framework is well established and used by the Global Burden of Disease Study in UNAIDS and offers a way for countries to answer some of the policy questions raised on the last slide. Notably, this model is driven by adult prevalence data and modeling assumptions around maternal to child transmission. And for my thesis, I work to assess potential inconsistencies and identify potential improvements in the current pediatric HIV model through the triangulation of maternal to child transmission with different empirical data sources. Uh, so now we can explore what empirical data we have access to and its possible utility within the current spectrum pediatric modeling framework. I was able to identify two new sources of case reports for Brazil through existing relationships between the global burden of disease study and country specific collaborators. Case reports provide numbers of newly diagnosed cases of HIV, which can be used to infer incidence. This doesn't directly measure incidence as there is a lag between the onset of HIV and diagnosis. One of these case reports sources, however, was stratified by CD4 category, which can be used to determine the progression of HIV. This provides more information on the time period between onset and diagnosis. We also have access to vital registration data or um, cause of death data through the Global Burden of Disease Study. This provides information on how many deaths caused by HIV there were in a given year, age, and sex. And it's a very valuable source of data as it measures exactly what we model. Because I used adult data in this analysis to infer about pediatric transmission, I first wanted to give an overview of how HIV, HIV dynamics in adults relate to those in children. Pediatric transmission is fully attributable to vertical or maternal to or mother to child transmission. Transmission can either occur in utero during the birthing process or during breastfeeding. 80% of all pregnant people in Brazil are tested for HIV. And there are a variety of prevention options to to prevent transmission during these periods. These can be started either before or during pregnancy. There's some difficulties in modeling this process. Um, one such issue is the time of maternal incidence. It's known that the onset of HIV in the mother has impacts on the probability of it transmitting to the child. However, this is difficult to measure in surveys and studies and from this difficult to incorporate into models. So now that this work is a bit more contextualized, I wanted to outline how I accomplished um, using adult HIV data to improve pediatric estimates. Um, I accomplished this through two aims, the first triangulating maternal prevalence estimates using adult case reports and vital registration data, and the second by evaluating current maternal to child transmission parameters using the outcome of AIM-1 and case report data for those under five years of age. Case report data can be used to infer an incidence hazard that's required to run the spectrum modeling process. This input incidence hazard then determines maternal prevalence and pediatric incidence. However, case reports do not capture the lag between HIV onset and diagnosis, which is important when trying to back calculate an incidence that makes sense compared to vital registration data. Currently, the Global Burden of Disease Study uses a standard five-year lag between onset of HIV and diagnosis, and this is used as a post hoc adjustment in the modeling process. This creates inconsistencies between incidence prevalence and mortality estimates. And we can improve upon that method using um, CD4 stratified case report data. The plot on the right shows the relationship between CD4 and time since onset. CD4 counts follow the progression and decrease as the severity of HIV increases. CD4 stratified case reports gives us information that can be used to infer the time between onset of HIV and observation at diagnosis. Five minutes. To improve the estimate of time between onset and diagnosis, I determine the probability of a given number of years between onset of HIV and diagnosis for a given CD4 category, age, and year using the transmission prob transition probabilities described in the table. I then applied these to the time series of case reports to infer incidence. I capped the number of years between onset and diagnosis at 10 years, as previous work indicates that 80% of all incident cases are captured within 10 years after onset. So from this on the right, we can see a new time trend of incidents on the bottom in the solid dark line. 
This extends the information provided by case reports back further in time to create a full time series of incidents hazard for 15 to 49 year olds. Using that as an input into spectrum, we're able to create estimates of deaths in women of reproductive age that are much closer to observed deaths in VR data. In the plot on the top, we can see that the case report informed deaths in blue follow deaths observed in the um, federal registration data in red fairly well. For comparison, I also included um, the number of deaths estimated by Brazil um, in green. This comparison shows that the case report informed spectrum results align much more closely with BR data than those which were not adjusted. Because I'm interested in how this improvement to adult prevalence es affects estimates of pediatric mortality, on the bottom we have the impacts of this change on pediatric mortality. We don't see much of a change on the shape of under five deaths. This is likely due to the large impacts that treatment has on pediatric deaths. Um, in contrast to deaths, triangulating maternal prevalence using case reports and VR data doesn't or does provide really great alignment for pediatric incidents, especially in the pre-treatment era before the year 2000. We can fairly safely assume that there's less of a lag for this age group um, as there is much more frequent interaction with medical care. We can obviously see that the peak of incidents for the case report unformed spectrum results, the solid line, is higher than those listed in the case reports, and that post-2007 spectrum seasons to underestimate the number of incident cases. Again, this is likely due to incorrect treatment data. Two minutes. The treatment data used in the Global Burden of Disease study for Brazil was last updated in 2013, so there was much room for improvement here. This is shown in the blue lines on the plot to the right. To begin, I scaled these coverage numbers to the new number of um, HIV births that were estimated in the first aim. We also received updated adult treatment information that I used to inform maternal ART coverage, which is a prevention of maternal to child transmission method. To do this, I fit linear models between women's ART coverage and coverage before and during pregnancy by year for countries in Latin America. And the equations listed then, R1 represents the ratio between total ART coverage to ART coverage before pregnancies for countries in Latin America where this is available, and R2 represents the ratio of ART coverage before pregnancy to that of during pregnancy in the same group of countries. I then propagated uncertainty through a variance-covariance approach. As you can see on the right, this results in lower um, prevention of maternal to child transmission coverage um, for two of the options. Um, on the bottom. The ART before and during pre pregnancy began early and in general, or in the time series, in the to reflect the new general population AT, ART. These updated treatment estimates improved the fit fairly drastically compared to the UNAIDS um, or Brazil informed incident spectrum run without adjusted PMTCT. The root mean squared error for the PMTCT adjustments was about 150 lower than that of the non-adjusted baseline. As we can see in the plot on the right, the peak incidence is now more in line with case reports, and the confidence interval on the black line was derived from the variance-covariance approach to display uncertainty in scaling general population treatment to maternal treatment. So to, so to summarize the discoveries presented here, it appears that we are able to integrate adult case reports into the spectrum modeling framework to produce results that are more internally consistent between incidence, prevalence, and mortality estimates. It's also apparent that the lag between HIV onset and diagnosis varies by age group. And there's also, it's also very likely to vary by location, which provides a future platform for innovation. The implications being, of this being that countries are able to better assess gaps in service and the potential ethic effects of reducing time to diagnosis on their HIV epidemic. It also points to gaps in the scale of which individuals aren't being captured in diagnosis data, especially for pediatric cases. To some extent, it also seems that the general population treatment numbers can be used to inform prevention of maternal to child transmission coverage. Um, this characterizes treatment disparities between the pregnant population and the general population and also informs investments needed to prevent future HIV-related morbidity and mortality. Um, and that is all I have here, but I am very open for questions if anyone has any. Great, thank you, Maggie. Mm -hmm. Great job. Thank you. I'm going to pause to see if anybody in the audience has questions. And remember, uh, we prioritize student questions. Any of Maggie's peers or um, committee members like to ask a question? Okay. 
Okay, I'll, I'll throw out a warm up question then. <laughs> um, so um, my question is, um, can you speak a bit more? You you touched on this at the end, but uh, about the practical implications of your findings. I know you you mentioned um, that there are certain gaps that um, this information revealed, but how would we put some of this uh, your results into practice to kind of you know improve our treatments and that sort of thing? Mm -hmm. um, so I think a big one is understanding the scale to which we're not capturing um, potential pediatric HIV cases. Um, so practically in Brazil, um, that can allow us to implement uh, more programs that are aimed at directly testing that age group um, and then try to meet um, our estimated number of child cases as that will allow for the gap um, to be filled between the two. Okay, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Nora, I don't see anything in the chat other than praise. <laughs> yeah, I have one. You. Oh, Allison has one. Okay, great. Go I ahead, Allison. Um, I was just surprised that the ANC coverage for uh, maternal testing was 80%. It seemed a little bit low. So I just was curious if there were better sources of the antenatal testing coverage that would be different than maybe the general population? Um, so stratified by key populations, is that what you're meaning or? Well, uh, I, maybe I missed it or misinterpreted what you said, but I thought you were using the 80% based on like the general population. Um, oh, I see. Who was tested rather than like often in pregnancy, the testing coverage is high because it's sort of a check mark as part of antenatal care. Right, so um, in, my background work, I found that 80% of pregnant people were tested or screened for HIV, um, which then also kind of is confusing given that I also found that 80% of um, incident cases were diagnosed within 10 years of onset. Um, so two different 80% there, but um, yeah, I'd be interested if you have other sources on uh, the rate of antenatal um, testing for pregnant people. No, if that's what, that's what they're reporting. It just is quite low compared to most other countries, which are, you know, exceeding 90, 95. Um, so it was just surprising that it was so low in Brazil. I'd be curious, um, you know, not related to your estimate maybe, but like why it's so much lower in Brazil than in other places, or if that's more in line with um, South America, perhaps, not sure. Yeah, I'll for sure have to dig into that and explore that a bit, I feel like in my written thesis. Great, thank you so much, Maggie. That was really, really good. Thank you. Um, we're, we're at time, so thank you so much. And uh, yeah, we're gonna kick it off to Addy. Cool. Thanks, Maggie, that was awesome. Okay, can you see that? Okay, you're seeing the right thing. <laughs> yeah, yes, we are, definitely. On my cheat sheet, okay, <laughs> great. Um, well, hi everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming and welcome to my capstone presentation on developing a theory of change for Choose 180. Um, so I was connected to Choose 180 through my research assistantship. Um, so I'd been working with the organization for several months prior to my capstone. Um, and Choose 180 is a nonprofit community-based organization that was created in 2011 as a community-centered partnership with the King County Prosecuting Attorney's Office to divert young people out of juvenile detention. And Choose 180's mission is to transform systems of injustice and support the young people who are too often impacted by these systems. Um, the organization therefore primarily serves youth and young adults whose behavior has been criminalized, um, so primarily Black, Indigenous, and young people of color, and works to dismantle the criminal legal system and build community-based solutions. And Choose 180 has undergone substantial growth in its programming and reach over the last several years, both to kind of adapt to changing community needs and because of increasing political momentum in King County to eliminate juvenile detention altogether. So the organization now engages in a wider range of work, including efforts to interrupt the school to prison pipeline and prevent youth violence. So they now have a range of programs um, for youth who are at risk for expulsion from school, 
who have been experiencing gun violence um, or who are involved in the crim criminal legal system. And after all of this growth, there was a need for the organization to kind of collectively reflect on the vision for the future and to recenter on this vision together. Um, additionally, King County recently did a yet to be published um, evaluation of Choose 180 program participation, which showed that 90% of young adult participants have not had a new conviction in the last five years. So while the program is doing really great work according to legal system measures of success, Choose 180 wanted to articulate their own definition of success and to develop their own indicators of progress for future evaluations. So before I get into the rationale for this work that I did for my capstone, I wanted to provide a quick definition and overview of theories of change. Um, so if we break down the phrase theory of change, a theory is a system of ideas that are used to explain something. And change, as I'm sure you all know, is the act of making or becoming something different. So a theory of change is basically just ideas around how a change process happens. And theories of change um, usually describe first the change that a group hopes to see in the world. So like a vision for the future. It describes how you envision that change process happening. So you can think of it as like a roadmap from where we are now to the vision for the future. It describes the group's role in bringing about change. So what it is that you do to make change happen. And it can also include why change is necessary. Um, theories of change can be shown in a visual format like this one. So we have a uh, long-term outcome or the vision for the future. There's a kind of visual of the change process and then um, some depiction of what the group does to uh, bring about change. So like you could say, you know, I implement a program here and it acts on the change pathway. Um, and then why change is necessary is often just kind of written somewhere. These can also be shown in a narrative format. Um, so theories of change are really flexible tools with no kind of prescribed format for what exactly they need to look like. And the process of developing a theory of change can allow organizations to come together to articulate their vision for necessary community change and to succinctly articulate a complex change process by describing how and why desired outcomes will occur as a result of specific activities over time. Theories of change are also often developed for um, theory-driven evaluation of interventions um, and as research frameworks for defining change processes. So our goal for this project was to develop an evidence-supported theory of change for Choose 180 to clarify and articulate First, what change their staff and their youth program participants hope to be a part of. Second, how they envision this change process happening. And third, the organization's role in bringing about change. So theory of change development methods vary widely with respect to who owns the development process and the extent to which the theory of change reflects either individual perspectives or evidence from the literature. And we decided that Choose 180's theory of change development process should be participatory in nature, meaning centered around the participation and perspectives of Choose 180's community. And we did this for three major reasons. First, um, it makes the development process itself a deliverable and an important opportunity to sta for staff to revisit and recenter the organi organization's vision in their own words. Second, a participatory development process allows staff and program participants to have full ownership over the final theory of change. And third, this process centers the perspectives of the people who are most knowledgeable about and affected by the issue that we're describing, um, which is a central value of Choose 180s. So in this case, this meant including young people and all of Choose 180's staff in the development process. And because of my positionality as a newcomer in Choose 180's community, and as a person without lived experience of coming from a criminalized community or working as staff at Choose 180, um, and just because of what Choose 180 needed in this process, um, my role was a facilitator. So listening, reflecting back, and synthesizing information. Five minutes. So first, I reviewed all the materials I could get my hands on describing Choose 180's programs to better orient myself to the organization. So I went to staff meetings, spent time on site, and attended sessions with youth participants to kind of engage in conversations and get to know Choose 180's community. 
I also reviewed the scholarly literature to determine methods and best practices for co-creating um, theories of change for community programs and to understand for myself and describe the socio-political environment affecting the population of young people served by Choose 180's programming. Then I used a workshop format to gather qualitative data for the final theory of change. Um, so we called these drafting sessions and these were 90 minutes long um, and all sessions were conducted over Zoom uh, between February and April due to the state of the lovely COVID pandemic at the time. Um, so I was able to work with all of the staff at Choose 180, so that was about 25 people um, and 13 young people who participate in their programs. Um, and I used Jamboard software to create a participatory environment in the online sessions. So the way these sessions worked was I would pose questions to the group for reflection and brainstorming. Um, folks would write down their thoughts and answers to each question on the Jamboard, and then we had some lively discussions interacting with the Jamboard where we started kind of building out the theory of change conceptually in real time. And then following each session, I would copy ideas from the Jamboard to Lucid chart, um, combining ideas that were similar, removing anything duplicative and clarifying the language. And then I put together a first draft of the theory of change reflecting the discussions that we'd had in the drafting sessions. Um, then third, I facilitated an edit iterative editing process, um, where again, in online groups, we read through the theory of change and had kind of constructive feedback discussions. I drafted a report detailing the project process um, and then sent our final draft of the theory of change to a very talented uh, graphic designer to make sure that it looked awesome and, and was readable um, and was something that Choose 180 wanted to sort of present themselves. The deliverables for this project were a written and visual or a visual and narrative theory of change and then a sort of extensive report detailing the, the process. In terms of what this actually looked like in practice, um, at the end of each of the drafting sessions, I had a bunch of pages that looked like this. Um, so I would kind of synthesize them um, and put them together into Lucid chart. Um, initially coming up with a big messy thing that looked like this, um, I got a few rounds of feedback um, from staff initially and then put together um, a new version that looked like this. Um, I took this again back to staff, back to young people, sort of talking to them about what resonated, um, what didn't, did some sort of member checking, um, and then sent it over to our graphic designer. And we finally ended up with uh, this. And um, it's actually a two page document. And sadly, I won't have time in this presentation to read through all of it, but I'll leave it up at the end so that folks can read through it on their own during our question and answer session. Um, but just as an overview, this kind of reads um, bottom to top and left to right. Um, so at the ribbon down on the bottom, we have Choose 180's role in bringing about change um, in the hexagonal honeycomb shape. Um, we have the pathway of change uh, reading bottom to top. And then on the right, we have the vision for the future. The second page goes into more detail around Choose 180's role, articulating specific activities that the organization does. Um, and then we have their values um, and some assumptions underlying the logic of the theory of change. Um, so I just wanna thank uh, Tasha and to all of the Choose 180 community for really creating kind of the most wonderful um, capstone experience I could have imagined. Um, Sarah Gimble for being a really great mentor throughout the whole process. Um, Amy Hagopian and the PHI 590 class for helping me sort of conceptualize this and getting this off the ground. Um, and Sarah Coombs, our designer extraordinaire, um, also my mother, uh, as, it, as it turns out. Um, so thank you, mom, for bringing it across the finish line and making it look so beautiful. Um, so I'll leave this up and we'll take any questions. Thank you, Addie. What a great job. Um, beautiful um, slides and presentations. I, I don't know if I should ask a question or read, but I will take a pause <laughs> and uh, um, see if anyone in the audience has a question. And, and remember that we're prioritizing student questions. 
There's nothing yet. Oh, okay. Uh, I see a hands up from from Amy. So let's let's start with Amy first. Go ahead, Amy. Thank you. Yes, I'm unfortunately on the bus, but um, I really followed this closely, uh, Addie, and I'm so impressed with this result. I wonder if you might speak to whether there were any differences that you noticed between the views of the participants, the youth in the program compared to the staff as they were articulating the theory? Yeah, yeah, so there were definitely little, there were definitely differences. Um, and so I actually, this is kind of only a part of the products that I ended up um, sort of turning into Choose 180. Um, well, I have yet to actually turn it in, but um, the, I ended up creating two versions. So this is a version that encompasses both staff and youth perspectives. And then I also did a version that um, highlights just the, just like a youth created theory of change. Um, and I had a specific session with um, young people where I sort of asked them about what, whether they could sort of pull, parse out the differences between their theory of change and this theory of change that was combined. Um, and they sort of talked about how in their theory, their theory of change is really centered and focused on the way that community engages with itself. Um, so really thinking about community change as something that um, is really emergent um, and doesn't sort of focus on, on young people, whereas this theory of change um, focuses on community change at large, but specifically with regards to community. So this theory of change focuses on the way that community engages with young people. Um, so it was just sort of like a difference in, in framing that was kind of the biggest difference. Um, and then there were some smaller differences as well. Um, but they, the young people that I talked to said that they felt um, that that kind of framing really made sense for this because Choose 180 is an organization that focuses on young people. Um, yeah. That is so interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I see a comment in the chat um, and a lots of positives. Um, I do have a, a quick question maybe I'll ask. Yeah, Deepa, if you want to go ahead and ask and then we'll wrap up after that. Okay. Um, so please take note, Addie, if anything comes up in the chat for you to answer and also all of the um, positives that you see in the chat. Um, my question is, um, you know, it's it clearly a lot of work went into this um, and I commend you for that. I, I wonder if you could speak to um, any lessons learned or any thoughts you've had kind of as you put this together. Oh, I wish that we could have done this or that and, and before, you know, if you were to do it again, lessons yeah. learned. Yeah. Um, so one of the main lessons learned, I would say, in kind of getting into the nitty gritty of a theory of change development process um, was really that like a 90 minute session. So I did multiple 90 minute sessions with kind of small groups of people. And really like a, a 90 minute session was just not long enough to kind of build out a theory of change. Like it, it takes a long time. And so if I were to do this again, um, I would love to have sort of multiple half day sessions where we all got together and kind of worked through it and built it out in real time. And I think we were able to kind of do it in a more patchwork way um, this way, just because of the constraints of like working on Zoom and um, just like everything the organization had going on at the time. But I think um, one of my sort of lessons learned or feedback that I would give if someone were to do this again would be to um, find a time to really commit, you know, half a day or a day or two to sort of doing this um, and kind of building it out together in real time. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. It was a great response. And thank you so much for all this work. So we'll um, go ahead and move to the next presenter who is Oscar Lua. Oscar, you have the mic. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can. We, oh, there we go. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes, uh, and now. Uh, also, 
I have to put my camera on. Either way, you could also keep your camera off if it's if it's better for the bandwidth. Either way, we can okay. hear you fine. Okay. So, can you see my slide? Yep, you're good to go. Okay, thank you. Um, so, I'm going to talk to you about uh, my study, which is uh, reverse vaccine hesitancy uh, on Bashan Island. And my thesis committee members are uh, uh, Dr. Michelle Andresik and uh, uh, Dr. Scott Lamontagne. So vaccine hesitancy is defined as delay in acceptance or refusal of vaccination despite av uh, availability of the vaccines. According to uh, the WHO, vaccine hesitancy is one of the top 10 trends as first to global health. And vaccination plays a major role in helping us finally come out of this pandemic. Bashan Island is a small community of approximately 10,000 inhabitants, just 20 minute ferry ride from Seattle. Historically, uh, Bashan has been deemed a vaccine hesitant community, especially as it relates to childhood immunization. But Bashan is not a place that does not care about its children. What I did learn about uh, this community is that they center uh, a uh, on a more holistic approach to health. However, Bashan has the highest COVID 19 vaccine rate in all of King County. And I really wanted to understand why. I really wanted to understand the views of parents regarding the choice to receive the COVID-19 vaccine. And after um, having delayed or refused routine immunization for the children and, oh, sorry. Uh, immunization for the children. And I wanted also to understand the experience uh, taking the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, as uh, it influenced the course uh, perception about the required uh, childhood vaccination. To answer my, uh, my research question, I used the following method which involved close collaboration with Bashan local organizations. So I did some community outreach and some canvassing. And my overall strategy was to conduct in-depth interviews with parents to better understand uh, the perspective. I use a mix uh, of purposeful and snowball sampling strategies, focusing on parents who met my study criteria. Uh, interviews were conducted and transcribed using Zoom. And um, I, uh, what is really interesting about this study uh, is the use of also rapid qualitative analysis as a special method and also a rigorous one. Here's a schematic about uh, the framework that I use. Uh, and this is a well-known framework which is used in the field of vaccine hesitancy and most public health research. Uh, so this is a descriptive of my population. I, I conducted 12 uh, in-depth interviews and uh, the average uh, uh, time of people living on Bashan was 14 years and also the average uh, age was uh, 50 years. And most of my participants identified I Caucasian. Based on my work, three main themes emerged. First, uh, the fear of COVID, uh, the threat uh, of perceived risk. Second, social norms uh, uh, about doing the right thing and protecting the communities. And lastly, uh, to ease the access um, to COVID-19 vaccine. And I'm gonna go into each of them a little bit more. Our first finding is that COVID was perceived as a real threat to community. Some participants mentioned a well-known community leader who died from COVID-19 and that was a turning point in realizing how real COVID-19 was compared to other childhood illnesses. So uh, that real experience of someone dying from a disease they were able to witness themselves made a big change into uh, the COVID-19 uptake uh, on the island. So uh, our second finding, um, because of the perceived threat, there was fear of wanting to be ostracized. So it became a thing for everyone to get uh, the vaccine. There were policies in place where uh, you can't go to restaurant or even family events if you were not vaccinated. So social pressure uh, played a big role, uh, which was not the case for uh, childhood immunization. And our third finding, uh, which was about uh, uh, facilitating the access uh, to COVID-19 vaccination on uh, the island, uh, was mostly done by volunteers on the island. So uh, the response was entirely led by volunteers who operated drive-throughs, walk-in clinics, and pharmacies. And those places were used as vaccine delivery spots. And the volunteer helped deliver the vaccine to 
even those who had mobility issues. So a system was put in place for online signup and volunteer provided computer assistance for those who had issues. And as you can read and on some of these quotes. So uh, in conclusion, uh, this was my first time doing qualitative research and I learned so much about this process. And one of the key takeaways is don't be quick to judge. Most participants uh, that are part of the community uh, really express uh, the need of being heard. And uh, uh, the community is a very uh, integrated social network. So really understanding that network and seeing who are the key players seems to be very important uh, for the goal to getting people vaccinated. I also okay. wanted to reflect on my positionality. Most of my patients uh, or my participants identified as Caucasian. I think being African, not from the United States, my racial ethnic identity might have played a role in the way my participants were more comfortable talking to me about this very sensitive topic. Research is entirely objective. Uh, objective. It comes from our own subjective experiences and we kind of come into it uh, trying to understand phenomena, not because we are thinking of our participants are people who refuse to get their children vaccinated, but uh, because uh, uh, we think of them as people who have a reason to make the choices uh, that they make. And I think they need to be heard. In conclusion, I have three main public health recommendations. Uh, first, I wanted to frame vaccine acceptance as a social norm. Second, to create uh, a transparent and truthful vaccine uh, message, uh, truthful vaccine messaging. And lastly, identify uh, trusted sources of information for effective and tailored community engagement strategies. And uh, I want to thank uh, my committee members. I want to thank uh, the community of Bastion, uh, and thanks to whom uh, this study was made possible. I really want to thank my committee members who really uh, helped me and supported me during this uh, very sometimes challenging uh, process. I also want to thank my family members and my friends and all those who supported me on this project. And I'm open to any questions. Thank you so much, Oscar. That was a wonderful presentation. I'm going to um, pause to see if any of your fellow students have any questions they'd like to pose or any committee members or faculty will prioritize the students. I see Claire has her hand up. Please go okay. ahead, Claire. Thanks so much. Oscar, this was really, really great. It's a really interesting study, especially given the climate of you know, COVID um, vaccine. So one thing that you mentioned briefly was about your use of a rapid qualitative approach. So I think from the implementation science lens, we're always trying to have approaches that get the information out as quickly as possible to policymakers, implementers, and even community work um, community members. So I want to just to hear from you, like how was the process using this rapid approach, and what kind of recommendations would you have for other people who are kind of under a time pressure but want to do a really rigorous job of qualitative research? Oh, uh, thank you so much, Claire, for your question. I I think uh, as I mentioned a little bit, this is. Uh, that was a very uh, unique and uh, very important uh, experience for me. And using rapid qualitative uh, method, which is not the conventional uh, method of uh, 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 collecting data, coding, and uh, coming up with them of doing the thematic analysis, uh, it was really interesting to see how effective and how rigorous this method can be. Uh, and also, uh, I've read some articles um, that is uh, going to be in my paper that kind of emphasize uh, the important, the uh, same level of rigorousness when it comes to the use of this method of analysis. And also, the importance of it is that it can be um, very efficient in getting uh, what is needed, the information that is needed out there. For instance, I'm in touch with uh, Vashon uh, local organizations and they're eager to know about my findings so that they can uh, kind of adapt uh, the, uh, uh, the intervention strategies because we're not uh, quite yet out of the pandemic. Thank you. Great, thank you, Oscar. Um, so I see a question from Allison who says, amazing work, Oscar. Confidence in the vaccine and systems that are administering, administering have traditionally emerged as a factor that will increase or decrease uptake. What was your experience? 
Oh, um, I, I think uh, my my experience was uh, was a little bit uh, in that sense, uh, but it was mostly also about uh, the particular side of Bashan. Bashan is a community that I would say uh, is a little bit different from Seattle. And on Bashan, everybody knows everybody. Uh, there have some, there have been some uh, quote. For instance, uh, one participant said. Uh, on fashion, when you hear an ambulance rarely, you know, you certainly know who is in that ambulance, which might be a different case uh, when you in, in Seattle. So I think uh, the, the nature of the community uh, kind of helps uh, tailor uh, the intervention that can be applied for it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? And how are we doing on time, Nora? Uh, we have two minutes. Two minutes? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, oh, Fatima has one. Fatima, okay. go ahead. Um, thank you so much for that presentation, Oscar. This is um, not really a question, but just more of a comment. Uh, I really appreciated how at the end you sort of tied your positionality to uh, your ability to engage with the participants. I thought that was really powerful. Um, so I just wanted to say that and congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Fatima. Right. We're at time. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I was like, should I ask my question? No, I'll, I'll hold it. Okay. Uh, so we'll move on to the next presenter. Thank you so much, Oscar. Wonderful presentation and, and also um, discussion there at the end. Um, next presenter is uh, Hilma Nakambale. So you are next to take the floor. We're really excited to hear your presentation. The mic is yours. Oscar, is this still your screen or is this Helmo's? Yeah, I'm, I'm trying uh, to, I'm logged off. Can you do it from your end? Uh, I'm even, I signed out to, to leave the other uh, room, but it's still, I don't know why I'm still hearing. Uh, ooh. Okay, um, okay, okay. I, I got it, I got it. Hold on. I got it, okay. Okay, all right, good. <laughs> Hilma, I see your um, screens in the small slides too. I think you have to put it in presentation mode. There you go, okay. Uh, Hilma, you're on mute. Oh, thank you so much. Um, my name is Hilma Nakambale and my thesis is titled barriers to and strategies for early implementation of pharmacy delivered PrEP services in Kenya in analysis from routine data. My thesis chair is Andy Statachis and Katrina Otlar is a member of the committee. I'd like to start with the background for this study. Currently in Kenya, individuals at the risk of HIV acquisition mostly access oral pre-exposure prophylaxis PrEP from the clinics, which are the mainstay for PrEP. However, barriers such as long wait times and HIV associated stigma continue to limit access to clinic based PrEP. Kenya has over 6,000 registered pharmacies where most individuals access care as the first point of contact. Pharmacies in Kenya offer sexual and reproductive health services and integrating PrEP into these services would offer additional benefits, such as increasing testing, linkage to care, and early initiation for ART. So here, the, this is a picture of one of the pharmacies where our pilot study took place in Kenya. The first aim for our study was to identify the early implementation barriers to the pharmacy-based PrEP delivery model at five pharmacy sites in Kenya. And the second aim was to identify actions or strategies developed by pharmacy providers and study staff to address barriers encountered during the study period. The pilot study took place at five retail pharmacies in Kenya, two in Chisumu and three in Thika. Kisumu is a city located in Western Kenya with a population level HIV prevalence of about 
And Thika is located about 40 kilometers outside of Nairobi and has a population level HIV prevalence of about 6%. At the beginning of the study, pharmacy providers were trained on the essential components of the pharmacy delivered PrEP model, such as identifying potential clients based on the services of all products that they came to purchase at the pharmacies. For instance, if a client bought condoms or emergency contraceptives, that could be suggestive that they were sexually active and might have been at risk of acquiring HIV. Another aspect of training was on using a prescribing checklist to assess client eligibility for PrEP. The prescribing checklist had components such as PrEP screening, counseling, and medical safety assessment. Here we see an example of the prescribing checklist a template. During the study, 472 potential clients were screened for eligibility and 211 were initiated on PrEP by pharmacy providers within a period of six months. And during that period, research assistants stationed at each pharmacy complete, completed weekly observation reports detailing all encounters with potential clients and clients who came for follow-ups and those who were enrolled. A total of 74 weekly reports were completed during the study period from all the five pharmacies. Here we have um, an example of a weekly observation report, which has components such as uh, the, the, the products that clients came to buy from the pharmacy, the questions that they asked the providers, as well as the, the, the challenges or barriers that were encountered during that week. We used the weekly, the weekly reports that were completed by research assistants as a source of data for this study. We had three rounds of consensus coding using deduce. And after that, we presented our findings to all the team members, including pharmacy providers, research assistants, and PIs in Kenya and here at UDEP to confirm our findings and also to get additional inputs, especially from pharmacy providers and research assistants. We then combined all our findings from the reports and from the member checking meeting, and we organized the identified barriers and actions or strategies that were taken in response to the barriers according to the Consolidated Framework for Implementation Research, CIFA. Five minutes. Here are our main findings from, from, um, from the study organized according to the CIFA. The most identified barriers include discomfort among clients when discussing their sexual behavior with pharmacy providers, unaffordable fees for PrEP services, service disruptions when offering uh, PrEP to clients, and hesitancy to discuss PrEP with potential clients among some of the pharmacy providers. Here, I will discuss some of the main findings in details. At all pharmacies, research assistants reported that clients had indicated that the cost of PrEP services was too high for them. Clients paid a service fee of 300 Kenyan shillings for all services, including medications, HIV testing, and counseling. And here you see a quote from one of the uh, research assistants during the member checking meeting. In this pharmacy, most, most people do not want to pay anything for PrEP and only agree to pay as they are getting reimbursed for participating in the study. So providers re responded to this barrier by encouraging participants to use compensation that they received for participating in the study. Uh, the compensation was 500 Kenyan shillings. Another important barrier that we noted from the research assistance observation reports was that some providers found initiating clients on PrEP to be time consuming and disruptive to their workflow. Pharmacy providers did not have an allocated time to attend to PrEP clients for initiation or follow-ups 
Thus, they found it disruptive to leave their normal clients to attend to PrEP clients, especially because uh, PrEP takes a little, the process of offering PrEP takes a little bit of time. In response to this barrier, some, some providers asked clients to come back when they were less busy. And also um, some providers also attempted to speed up the process by multitasking, for instance, a quote from one of the pharmacies, the pharmacy provider fills out the prescriber's checklist with the study participants as the HIV test still runs to save on time, especially for participants being enrolled who are in a bit of a hurry. In conclusion, we found that barriers such as high service costs to clients have implications on access to pharmacy delivered PrEP. Pharmacy providers' frustration with, time, with the time consuming nature of PrEP delivery and workflow disruption highlight important considerations for pharmacy PrEP implementation. Hesitancy to initiate PrEP conversation with clients gives insight into important considerations for optimization of early implementation of pharmacy delivered PrEP in video pharmacy, for instance, offering uh, intensive training to providers. Implementing actions such as self-administered HIV risk self-screening option for PrEP clients, allowing flexible appointment scheduling and training newly hired providers can significantly improve the delivery of pharmacy PrEP. And lastly, to understand the underlying mechanism for all these barriers and, 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 and strategies that we have identified, further research should explore multiple perspectives such as client interviews and evaluate feasibility and effectiveness of interventions such as HIV risk screening, self-screening, as well as appointment scheduling of appointments. I'd like to give special thanks to all pharmacy providers and clients who participated in the study, all Kenyan pharmacy prep stakeholders, specifically partners in Health Kenya and Cambridge Research Assistants, Kenyan collaborators and HUDAP collaborators. This concludes my presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Hilma. Great job. Wonderful. I'm gonna pause for a second, but I do have a question that I'll throw out. If uh, any students uh, wanna take the first one. Oh, it, looks, it looks like it's you, Deepa. Okay, all right, okay. here's my question. Really interesting findings as I was sitting with it, this question emerged, you know, do you have ideas on what the training might look like that you would give to pharmacists um, to try to help them be more comfortable having these discussions with clients. I mean, um, not only what the training would look like, but also would they need an incentive to join such a training? I mean, what is the motivation to go through such a training where they have to kind of look and get comfortable with talking about, you know, sexual behavior um, as pharmacists? Do you speak a bit more about that? Yeah, thank you so much for the question. I think um, I, when I was going through literature though, in other places, pharmacists are comfortable with discussing sexual behavior and um, offering PrEP. I think um, the context of Kenya is probably influenced by cultural beliefs or religious beliefs that people think that offering PrEP would providers especially, not only in the pharmacies, even in clinics, think that um, offering PrEP would incentivize uh, clients to have promiscuous sexual behavior. And I think the training that most providers get is most, mostly about the technical aspects, the process of testing and, and counseling, rather than really the change of perspective when it comes to PrEP. And on incentives, the pharmacies were incentivized for, for were reimbursed and, and compensated for um, participating in the study. So I don't think it was an issue of um, compensation. I think it's just the context of uh, beliefs and, uh, and, and yeah. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, any other uh, questions from the audience? Well done, Helma. This is Andy. Uh, given that it's a pilot project, uh, how, from your perspective, how might the results influence scaling this up? Yeah, thanks, Andy, for the question. Uh, as I've alluded to in the conclusions, I have uh, highlighted that uh, providers would need intensive training to offer PrEP and also to um, look into how um, we could cut the costs for services, maybe uh, to um, have um, to have maybe the government offering PrEP in collaboration with private pharmacies so that uh, the cost to clients are not a lot. So I think our, our results highlight sort of um, um, the need for training as well as the need to cut costs and to understand the context of challenges such as uh, cultural beliefs that sort of limit providers to communicate with uh, PrEP clients. Great, thank you so much, Helma, for that really, really great presentation. Thank you. Um, Deepa, we're at time. Okay, all right, thank you. And, and Helma, take a look at the chat. If any other questions come up, you can answer there. And also, um, yeah, it, we there are a few comments in there. So um, <laughs> I just had to giggle, sorry, <laughs> at the, the latest comment in there. But um, we will move on. And our next presenter is um, Olivia Angelino. So you have the floor, Olivia. Awesome. Can you see my screen all right? Yes, looks great. OK, amazing. Um, hi, everyone. My name's Olivia Angelino. This is the presentation of my thesis, which was identifying drivers of exemplary family planning performance in LMICs from 2000 to 2017. Members of my committee included Annie Hackenstad, Stephen Lim, and Rafael Lozano. There we go. Um, a quick acknowledgement that reproductive health, especially family planning, has origins in racism and discrimination that have left permanent scars on individuals and communities. Um, a little context of what family planning means in this research um, refers to the use of contraceptive methods to delay our pregnancy by those who self-identify as a woman. So this doesn't account for contraceptive use for other purposes. It misses individuals who are at risk of pregnancy but don't identify as women. And it very much so assumes heterosexual relationships. It's a very heteronormative research field. Um, and then my positionality is I'm a cisgender white woman who resides in a high income country. And this analysis focused on low to middle income countries. So I do not reside in a country that was included in this analysis. Um, some background, family planning programs really became important in the 1950s and 60s amid population concerns. Um, but the field has really made some significant shifts to a focus on women's empowerment and rights, which has kept it very relevant. Um, there's a lot of debate around how to best increase contraceptive use in different philosophies. The main ones you'll see in the literature is that you should target supply. So ensuring women have access to contraceptives and they'll use them because they're accessible. Um, you can target demand, which is women will adopt contraceptives because they strongly need them. So increasing their desire to use a contraceptive method and then literature around kind of targeting both these sides of the equation um, that without targeting with one impact is limited on the other. Um, that's just kind of background on some of the literature around drivers. Um, the scope of my research, I focused on 108 low and middle income countries as they are classified in 2000. Um, we did this just because one data availability is a lot stronger. Um, and you can kind of see in this plot on the right, there was a lot of growth in modern contraceptive prevalence in these countries. Um, they were also the focus of a lot of funding. Um, so very interesting to explore what was kind of driving these changes. Um, we originally wanted to look at 1990 through 2019, but we had to restrict our analysis to 2000, 2017 due to family planning spending variables. Um, and then the two main outcomes of interest for modern contraceptive prevalence, which is the number of women using a modern method out of all women and then demand satisfied with modern methods 
which follows a complex algorithm, but essentially it's aiming to capture who has a need for family planning because they're at risk for pregnancy and wish to delay or prevent an initial or another birth. Um, and then among those who's using a moder modern method. Um, so the research aim was what are the drivers and relative contribution of those drivers to sustained increases in family planning outcomes across low middle income countries. The way we went about evaluating this is looking at various predictors and then plugging them into aggression with our outcomes and looking at the beta coefficients and then the standardized beta coefficients to remove the effects of the different scales of the predictors. Um, and then we also performed a Shapley decomposition of the R squared. This is basically just a way to say which predictor is explaining the most variance in the outcomes. Um, so this is kind of the framework that the analysis was based around. We're basically just trying to capture all the different mechanisms that could be driving family planning outcomes. And we split the work into three phases. Phase one focused on the enabling environment. So you can see very broad socioeconomic factors. Um, and then phase two was to incorporate um, family planning interventions. So ones that were targeted at demand and supply side. And then in phase three, we incorporated some additional variables that I'll cover on the next slide. Um, but this was kind of the breakdown of the work. Um, so the different drivers we examined um, in phase one, which was that enabling environment, were indicators that IHME already had fully constructed. And these are those like broad contextual factors. Um, so things like urbanicity and education, funding. And then in phase two, which looked at interventions, we used the family planning effort index. And then it was also combined in one year with the national composite index for family planning. And this is basically, a survey that was sent out to countries in different years where experts evaluate their national family planning programs and rank it from zero to 10 or zero to one on different aspects. Um, and obviously there's a lot of bias in that because experts have different perceptions of their family planning programs, plus they already know their outcomes as a way to evaluate how they're doing. So we selected a subset of indicators that had high correlation with outside indicators to kind of as a judge of validity. Um, and then took those 19, which were fairly correlated to three principal component analysis, create a single effort index on a scale of zero to 100. And then these indicators are only available for certain years. So we looked at three time periods, which were a cross sectional on 2014, and then 2004 to 2014, and 2014, 2017. Five minutes. Thanks. And then the last set of indicators we added was we worked to extract data from 965 family planning surveys and then used SDGPR, which is a flexible modeling tool to construct full time series of these estimates and these capture some of the supply and demand side family planning interventions and outputs. Um, so results from phase one of the analysis, which was looking at those enabling environment variables, you can see that, well, to orientate you guys to this plot, it's the co normal beta coefficient on the left and in the middle you have the standardized coefficient, so it's a little more comparable. And then the far right is our relative importance. So that's the Shapley decomposition. So which variable kind of explains the most variation in the outcomes and way to say which one is most important. Um, so in our phase one, we saw that conflict came out as the first most important followed by LDI, which is income. Um, then followed by education, abortion legality had very low importance, and then the proportion of married women, 1524, and then public spending, family planning spending also had relatively low importance. And then in phase two, which is where we incorporated the effort PCA index, um, I'm just going to show the cross-sectional results, but it was kind of consistent with the other two time periods we looked at, which was the effort index really didn't stand out among the other indicators. It had fairly low importance um, compared to some of our enabling environment variables, such as conflict, which was the number one, education, and then income again. And then in phase three, we added those other lists of new indicators um, to kind of just get the holistic picture of everything we wanted to include in the analysis. Um, you can see that knowledge of methods, which is the mean number of methods known by a woman of reproductive age, really stood out as the main driver in this context, um, followed by desire for limiting, which is the proportion of women who wish to delay any future, or not delay, but prevent um, any future pregnancies. And then conflict again stood out. Um, 
across all these indicators. So across the three phases, from phase one, we saw that conflict income, education, education and urbanicity were the most important enabling factors and that abortion legality really had little importance. Um, in phase two, which we saw to look at that effort index, it really didn't stand out at all and education continued to have a strong effect. And then phase three, knowledge of methods and desire for limiting were the most important of those new factors. Um, and that direct family planning interventions, such as field worker visits, the method information index, and that mass media messaging were not very important. Um, so behind the scenes, we ran a lot of different iterations of models, um, 25 in total. So what we did was look at the ranking of the variables using that relative importance and kind of took an average across all the phases to just account for all the different models. Um, and this is kind of the final list of drivers we came out of in the end. So for modern contraceptive prevalence, you have knowledge of methods, conflict, income, desire for limiting education, and then demand satisfied, which is highly correlated with modern contraceptive prevalence, some similar indicators, knowledge of methods, income, conflict, education, and then that present married 1524. Um, so just some overall discussion of what we saw in the findings was that the enabling environment generally had higher relative importance than some of these family planning programs and interventions. Um, knowledge of methods, which was that top one and really had a large impact, um, could really be reflective of education efforts as well as expanded method availability. availability and we didn't really have a way to tease those differences out. Um, and then education, which was also super important variable, just thinking of the COVID implications for what that could mean um, and how disruptions to education could translate to slow growth of family planning outcomes. Um, some recommendations that could fall out of this analysis is to promote family planning education and offer a multitude of contraceptive methods to kind of get at that knowledge of methods, um, ensure women have access to and are receiving education, and then expand access to contraception during times of conflict. Um, I imagine conflict kind of acts to disrupt service. So promoting even the use of long acting reversible contraceptives such as IUDs and implants to minimize the amount of times women have to go to a health facility or a pharmacy to get contraception. Um, some limitations and considerations that there were still gaps that remained in the main framework just due to data availability. Um, we didn't have any data on sex education in schools and kind of a lack of distinction between public and private sector activities and private financing and how to capture engagement of community members and religious leaders. Um, the overall R squared of models, um, so the total variation explained ranged anywhere from 30 to 70 meaning that there was still unexplained variation in the family planning outcome. So this is not <laughs> a comprehensive, we identified every driver. Um, there's still a lot that was not captured in this analysis. Um, and an area of future work would be to conduct a similar analysis, but on more of a country level of individual level data to more accurately capture how drivers impact an individual's decision to use contraception and then to really explore within country inequalities, I think decision to use contraception is very much so an individual and a personal one. So we lose kind of those nuances when we look at it at a country level. Yeah, and then just a huge thank you to everyone who supported me through this process, my committee, Annie, Raphael, and Steve, um, other IHME members who worked on this project, Abby, Audrey, and Kate, my roommates, Jack and Maggie for all the coffee um, and just other friends and my family for all the support. And happy to take questions. Thanks, Olivia. Really interesting work. I'll Thanks. pause. I'll pause for a minute to see if uh, any students or um, folks have any questions. I've got one waiting in the wings, but I'll wait. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna shoot my question then. Okay. Uh, okay. So so my question is. Um, you know, I think you were getting at this in your your later remarks, but um, I'm wondering if abortion legality is capturing the variable that you want it to. Um, and in that, I, I it was it seemed like it was a proxy for something else initially. Um, but I, I mean, what other variables could have captured what you were looking for there with abortion legality? Because I mean, you know, I, I'm imagining that 
many other countries kind of are the way we are here in the United States where there's a spectrum of beliefs that people have that lead to legality versus non-legality. So I, I wonder if a continuous variable would have captured what you were looking for a bit more. Um, but I, I just, and, and maybe that's why, you know, it didn't seem of that much uh, interest to your analysis. But anyway, I'll let you comment. Yeah, I think that's a super interesting point. And yeah, abortion legality doesn't change too much in our time period that we looked at, um, which I think also could have been a factor. But yeah, I'm not sure what other variable could have gotten at that because it's just such a complicated relationship with abortion and then contraceptive use. Um, yeah, I, yeah, open to any ideas or suggestions on that one, but I'm not too sure. I think you were getting at the, when you suggested more kind of honing in and getting more individual level data and that sort of thing and might have gotten into some of the nuances, it sounds like. Yeah, I don't know if maybe like prevalence or rate of abortions would even be a better indicator than legality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We have the data we work with, so great job. Um, let's see if anyone else has any other questions. I see lots of great presentations and congratulations in the chat. And don't forget if you have questions, oops, question from Steve, this is good. Um, Steve says, well done, Olivia. A bunch of countries, uh, Iran, Zimbabwe, Kenya, had made their big improvements in FP prior to 2000, the year 2000. How did, how did including them impact your findings? That's a good question. Um, I don't think I explicitly have an answer for that one. Um, I think in my write-up, I'm planning to dive into a lot more of the specific countries, um, but it was very much so just have so far been looking at the overall trends. Um, okay, well, perhaps this could, yeah. could be something you incorporate in uh, the rest of your research if you're continuing this. Thank you for the question, Steve. All right, Deepa, we're at time. Okay, thank you so much, Olivia. Great job. So we'll move to the next presenter who is Sai Wen Hya Tatong. So you are next. Okay. Uh, let and me the floor is my... yours. Let me share my screen. Can you see my screen? Hello? Yes, we can. Oh, OK. You're good. OK, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Sai Wen Hya Tatong. Uh, a second year MBA student from Global Health General Track. Uh, today, I would like to present my thesis called Prevalent and Correlate of Physical, Sexual, and Threatened Violence Among the Partners of People Who Injure Dreads Living with HIV in Kenya. Dr. Kerry Fagwa is my thesis uh, chair, and Dr. Brendan Guthrie is my thesis committee member. Uh, so, before my presentation, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to my uh, thesis committee and the chef study dean and investigator and all the chef study participants, head advisor, peer educator, and all the implementing partners and Kenya NASCOP and Kenya MOH for their uh, time, support, and contribution. And I also would like to thank to my sponsorship organization, USAID Pharma Legal Scholarship Program, IE and USAID, and all of my friends and family for their kind support. Uh, regarding my positionality, uh, I am an Asian male, I probably had a professional born and raised in Burma. And uh, my specific role in this project was as a graduate student conducted a secondary data analysis. Uh, right now, I would like to uh, express uh, uh, briefly about the background information of my study in Kenya. Uh, Kenya has the uh, that joint largest HIV epidemic in the world and 1.5 million people were living with HIV in Kenya in 2020 and the HIV disproportionately impacts on the key population, including the people who inject dreads, peewits, and the HIV prevalence among peewit was 18.3% compared to the 4.2% among uh, general adult population in Kenya in 2020. And on the other hand, violence is also a leading public health problem globally, and according to WHO report on the violence and um, uh, health, uh, it was mentioned that over 1.6 million people uh, lost their life every year because of violence. And then violence against the PWIS is also common in Kenya. 
and there is strong evidence of association between the violence and increasing risk of the HIV infection. That, that therefore a combined effect of epidemics of uh, HIV, drug use, and violence cause a huge burden on the people who interact and their partner population. In order to address uh, HIV burden among the peer population, it is not enough to focus only on the HIV and drug use. We need to understand how these health consequences are related to the violence and underlying determinants. So that is the reason why we conducted this secondary data analysis. So the first aim of our study was to determine the prevalence of different forms of violence among the partners of PWID. And we hypothesized that overall prevalence of experiencing different violence among study participants is different, depending on their gender and region. And then the second aim was to identify the factor associated with experience in the violence and mental study participants. And we hypothesized that there is an association between partner characteristics and experience in the violence. And then that, that aim was our study was to determine whether the correlate of experience in violence are different for male versus female and those living with HIV versus not. It means we would like to investigate the association between partner characteristics and Experience in violence is modified by gender and HIV status. According to the WHO ecological model, violence is a complex organ of the interaction between the individual, uh, interpersonal, community, and society level. Therefore, to understand the nature and distribution of violence among the study participants, we exclude the social demographic characteristics and personal experience of uh, each participant uh, to identify the you know, uh, potential uh, effect on the being victim of the violence. So uh, for this study, we used the cross-sectional study data science and conducted a secondary data analysis on the baseline data of the primary cohort study called the SHEP study. And then the primary study conducted in the eight main sites, uh, including the Buffy Head Center, and Nida Serena Program and Methadone Clinics in Nairobi, Kalifi and Mombasa County in Kenya, and total 3302 study participants involved in the study. Well, regarding the data collection, we used the primary, uh, the primary cohort study, used the convenience sampling strategy, and then the, uh, the investigator collected the data by using the structure questionnaire through the open data gate software on tablet device, and the collected data were uploaded to Kenya NASCOP server on a script connection. Regarding the uh, data analysis, we use the R statistical software and then 17 variable. Five minutes. Uh, according to our uh, analysis, it was found out that the prevalence of violence and men partner was 44%. And then uh, a man then physical violence was the higher form of violence, uh, followed by the threatened and sexual violence. When we compare uh, stratified by the gender, the prevalence of violence was higher among the male participants in general. However, when we look at the sexual, body, uh, sexual violence, it is higher among the female participants. Uh, regarding the regional difference, it was found out that uh, participants living in the coastal Kenya have higher experience of violence than participants uh, who live in Nairobi. And then uh, there is strong evidence of association the several partner characteristics and experience in the violence. Uh, as I mentioned in the previous slide, uh, the prevalence of violence was higher among the female participants compared to the female participants except the sexual violence. And then uh, for the regional difference, uh, participants living in the coastal region have higher experience of violence. And then regarding the marital status, participants who are in partner, divorce, separated or widow category reported higher experience of violence compared to participants who were single. And the participants uh, who have no stable place to live uh, have higher experience of violence than the participants who have stable housing. Uh, compared to the sexual partners, participants who have both sexual and injecting partners of violence uh, express higher experience of violence. In contrast, uh, injecting partners have lower experience of violence compared to the sexual, violence, sexual partners. And a man the male participant, men who were sex with men have higher experience of any form of violence compared to the men who were sex with women. <clears throat> Regarding the HIV and ARD status, the sexual violence is higher among the participants uh, who are uh, living with HIV and then who were not on uh, or ARD. For the drug use and methadone, 
uh, when we compare with the participants who have no active drug use and uh, people are on methadone, uh, the, the risk of violence was higher among the active injecting drug user and uh, people who are not on methadone. And then when we investigate uh, for the effect modification, uh, it was found out that the association between partner characteristics and experience in the violence was modified by the gender, but not by the HIV status. And these are the key findings from our analysis. Prevalence of violence were higher among the male participants, especially for the physical and threatened violence, and the sexual violence is higher among the female. And the participants who live in Costa have higher experience of violence than Nairobi. And then uh, there are several partner characteristics are associated with uh, experience in the violence, such as gender, region, marital status, stable housing, types of partner, sexual orientation, drug use, and methadone treatments. And then gender was an effect modifier uh, in the study, and then HIV status was not. There are a lot of limitations in our study. As the primary study used the convenience sampling strategy, selection bias may be associated. And then the collected data was self-reported and included sensitive information like the HIV drug use and sexual history, uh, recall bias or the desirability bias may be present. As our study is a cross-sectional study, we cannot infer for the causality and the result may not be generalizable. And then as a primary study mainly focus on the APS and not on the violence, we don't have complete data of uh, violence. And then the last one is we need more violence information at the community and society level to do the complete violence analysis. Uh, even though our research and association from our study cannot be generalizable and uh, cannot be inferred for uh, causality, uh, at least they can underline and important trends and distribution of violence, potential correlate and vulnerable subgroup among the people who injected population in Kenya. And then we hope that it will be helpful to formulate effective public health intervention and tools, evidence-based decision making and policy recommendation to increase the HIV service average among the key population while preventing the potential risks of violence. These are the reference that we took for our study. Yeah, thank you for your time. Thank you, Sai. Great work. I am Thanks. going to pause, see if any students have questions for you. All right, looks like Fatima has her hand up. Great, go ahead. Um, thank you so much for that presentation, Sai. That was really uh, well articulated. Um, in your presentation, you said that participants living in the coast reported higher experiences of violence than those from Nairobi. Um, do you think that there is any reason or explanation about why this disparity exists? Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Fatima, for uh, uh, for your question. That's a yeah, that's a great question. So. Uh, yeah, the violence is uh, higher among the participants who live in Costa in any form of violence. And then what I did, uh, uh, we thought that that is because of the difference in the, uh, you know, economics and, uh, you know, job opportunity between the Costa and Nairobi region. In some literature, it was mentioned that uh, the Costa region is, uh, compared to the Nairobi region, Costa Kenya have the uh, is more poor and then uh, characterized by the poverty and then there are a lot of sex work and then drug dealing and then uh, drug trafficking is also prevalent in the Costa Kenya and then um, I think uh, some of the uh, tourists in that industry they uh, like the you know heroin use and then sex, sex trafficking among the European tourists. Uh, in Costa Kenya is, you know, more than higher, higher amount uh, compared to the Nairobi. So I think that is the reason why uh, more prevalence of uh, violence among the coastal region compared to the uh, Nairobi region. I don't know. It's and does it answer your question or? Yeah, perfect. Thank, oh, you, thank so you so much. much. <clears throat> thank you, Sai. Um, I think I saw another question in the chat. If not, I've got a question, but. Um... Uh, Oscar's got his hand up. Okay, go ahead. 
Go ahead, Oscar. I say a uh, great presentation. Uh, you, you said male participants had higher experiences <coughs> of violence than females. Uh, this, I think, uh, contradicts what I was thinking. Do you have any ideas or possible explanation for that? Oh, uh, yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Oscar. That's a great question. Yeah, that is also, uh, that surprised me at the beginning of when I uh, first did the analysis. And then I was also thinking that uh, female bodies when we have more experience of violence than the male bodies that, but uh, when I did a same literature review and I was found out that uh, the male body spent in Kenya, the employment rate is higher among the male body spent than the female body spent. And then I think uh, they may have more exposure to the risk of, you know, I mean, dealing with the uh, different kinds of people and a different community. And then they are more risky to uh, get a, being violent. Uh, and then uh, they also mentioned that uh, the, the risk of police physical violence by the police is higher among the male body spent. And then, yeah, fem for female body spent, the, there is the, the risk of sexual violence is higher uh, in, in other literature as well. Thank you yeah, so that much. Is what I really, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you That's so really much. Great, Sai. And we have just about one more minute. So one quick question. Um, there's a question in the chat. Might as, uh, why don't, okay. I, I, yeah, I'll put my question in the chat, but um, Sai, uh, it looks like Nicholas Tintza. Oh, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Uh, so Nicholas says, Sai, you investigated a lot in your study and this is impressive. One question, what is, what is the main key policy application of your research? Could you elaborate more on that? Thanks. Oh yeah, Nicholas, uh, thank you so much for your, uh, uh, for your question. So for, for me is we would like to understand, we would like to find out the, you know, uh, what, what characteristics that are especially uh, associated with the experience in the violence. So by understanding, uh, uh, you know, by getting this answer, we will be able to focus which uh, among the, uh, you know, key population, which subpopulation that we have to focus more. Uh, for example, like uh, uh, in our, in, in my study, it was found out that uh, male participants who engage in the, uh, you know, sex work and then who use the dress and then who were not on the methadone. So this kind of sex group are uh, more prevalent to the, uh, of experience in violence. So I think by, by understanding, uh, you know, by identifying this set group, we will be able to, uh, uh, you know, tailor our intervention to, to reach those uh, vulnerable population. Yeah, that is what I thought. I don't know, is it, does it, am I, did I answer your question or? You're good, Zai. Thank That's, you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, and please do take a look at the chat and see all the praise that's there. And as okay. well, I, I pose my question to the chat, which you can answer in chat. So thank you so much, Zai. Great job. Thank you so much. Thanks. And then we have our last presentation for the afternoon. Um, so I'll turn it over to Wangmo Sering. The mic is yours. Can you hear me? I just need to check my... Can you hear me? Yes, okay. I can hear you. I can hear you. Okay, let me share my screen. I can see your notes here. You might want to put in presentation mode. See it now. Yep, there you go. Looks good. Hello everyone, um, I'm Sirin Angmo, I go by Angmo, and I'm a Master in Public Health and Global Watch Certificate Candidate in Department of Global Health here at University of Washington. My thesis is a qualitative study done in Upper Dopo with the title that is shown in the, <laughs> in the slide. Um, just before going into my thesis presentation, I would like to shortly state 
Um, my positionality, I identify myself as Topo women, being born and raised in the community that I conducted my study in. And I spent most of my career working in the same community. Um, I was raised by women, this amazing women in the right, my granny. Um, and work with and for women most of my life. Um, I have no personal direct experience of childbirth, however, experience personal loss of my mom to childbirth and have experience with supporting birth. Actually, the baby in the picture in the left is one of the baby that I did help deliver in the community. Um, oops. Okay, it's acting up. So. Um, so since we will, we will be talking about um, maternal health and just an overview of maternal health globally and in Nepal, WHO estimated that in 2017, approximately 820 women die every day from preventable pregnancy and childbirth related causes. And not surprisingly, 94% of all these deaths occur in low and middle income countries. South Asia alone um, contribute one fifth of the total. Um, however, Nepal achieved a commendable reduction in maternal mortality ratio in the millennium development era by 70% from 543 in 1997 to 239 in 2016. And this is highly attributed to the introductions of safe motherhood policies and programs like AMA program, which actually incentivize incentivize women for completing for ANC and provide transportation fairs and free institutional deliveries. Despite all the achievement, there is a great disparity in regional disparities. And one of these example is that according to the Nepal Demographic and Health Survey 2016, province two has the highest utilizations of maternal services with 71% institutional deliveries. In comparison, Karnali province where the study site is has the lowest with 36% of institutional deliveries. So um, the study um, site is Dolpobuddha Ruler Municipality in Kanali region, uh, which is in the red on Nepal's map on the top right, is one of the three mountain ruler municipality in Dolpa district of Kanali province and one of the most remote in all Nepal. It is inhibited by an indigenous Buddhist community identifying themselves as Dolpo. It is located 4,000 meter above sea level. There is only a dearth of literature in on health in general and even less in maternal health. The only reliable um, reliable and latest source of data that I could get is from the Health Management Information System 2018 and 2019, which reported that out of 30 pregnant women who came for their first ANC, only one woman completed their four ANC and all of the women delivered at their home without any trained support. Um, so I was really interested to kind of learn why there is low utilization of maternal service, despite all the effort. And um, to kind of understand these questions, I uh, went into this study with a very broad questions of what factors do women consider while making decision regarding who, where, when, and why to seek help during their pregnancy and childbirth? What option do women think they have to help them with their pregnancy and childbirth? Um, at the beginning of my study, I employed socio-ecological model as my conceptual framework to guide my um, research instrument as well as my data <laughs> analysis, thinking that they would be factor at individual, interpersonal, community, and system level. To answer all the questions, I employed exploratory qualitative method among women of reproductive age who have given birth in the past three years before this study began. I recruited 21 women uh, from propulsive and snowball sampling method. Primary data was collected by in-depth interview by phone using semi-structured interview guide with narrative approach. What I mean by narrative approach is women in this study were allowed to narrate their story at their own pace and sequence, which in local language is known as kitu kipolda, which means sharing the stories of happiness and sorrow. And if there are any questions that remain unanswered, the interviewer being myself in this study probed those questions to get the answers. Even though I went in this study with a very broad questions of like looking into different factors is the analysis progress, social culture values and belief emerge as core factor influencing decision at all the levels. Even structural factors like distance and birth friendliness of birthing center were discussed in relations and in context of social cultural values and belief. 
However, I would say that it's very important to acknowledge, especially in this, um, this study, that all these cultural beliefs and um, values are practiced as a safety measure to prevent and protect the baby and women from any kind of risks and uncertainty that the childbirth subject the women to. Um, throughout the presentations of my findings, the term Amchi will come across a lot. And Amchi are the traditional herbal medicine practitioners who also are spiritually trained. So they are kind of religious figure as well. Um, and out of all, from the analysis, we found three, we identify four main themes. The first theme is secrecy and birth outcome. Childbirth, especially labor, is culturally something that should not be shared with others and should be kept as private as possible. Sharing the childbirth or sharing these information with others is supposed to break the secrecy in local terms is called chasher, which will then bring, is believed to make labor more, more complicated and longer. This is stated by most of the women in this study as a reason why they do not want to go to the clinic and its status un unsolicited. It's one of my, uh, it's one of my participant, participants state that if I call the local healthcare provider, my husband will have to go to the and people will know that I'm going through labor pain. So if I call the Amchi, he lives nearby and people will assume that he's going for another purpose. I give, when I gave birth to my first baby, it took very long and people think that it's because many people came to know. Similarly, my, another participant stated that, you know, they say not to let other people know. And if I go to the clinic, the whole village will know. The second theme is childbirth is impure. Childbirth is treated as impure phenomena. The belief has certain implications, especially who they want while they are giving birth and where they give birth. Men are not preferred to be around to protect them from impurity. Similarly, certain places are treated as sacred, like places around the monasteries, or on certain lands are believed to be protected by land protectors and deities. Because of this, people and women fear to give birth in these areas, thinking that they will have a higher chance of upsetting the land protectors and deities, thus exposing themselves and the baby to more risks. As one of my, uh, my participants said that if I had to call someone or there are any complications, I think I would call the local healthcare provider or AMCHI. But if I have a choice, I would not call AMCHI because they are men and they, they're a steep, which means impurity. Similarly, my, another participant said that people also say that the place where the clinic is built is very super, means the land protector is very aggressive. So I'm afraid something might happen. The another theme is Lungta and Rijo. Lungta has a very different meanings in Buddhist, um, Buddhist texts. Uh, the literal meaning is wind hearse. You might have seen all this prayer flag if you went to Nepal. But in this context, the nearest meaning is good luck or positive energy. The community believe in Lungta. So this belief is shown to impact women's acceptance of birth outcome is determined by their or the baby's luck rather than anything else, including the health services, which sometimes undermine the service seeking. As one of my participants said, the biggest thing is our Lungta. If I have Lungta, things will go well. If not, then everything will work to make it not go well. Similarly, ritual, especially as an intervention to prevent or kind of a measure to, for complication is valued highly. And this, is a, this has an impact on who they seek help from. As one of my participants stated that that, this, that time it was like three days and the baby was not still coming. So um, the doctor, so all the family said, we better call doctor and Amchi. The doctor might have medicines or maybe pull the baby and maybe we might need to do Kurim, which means regional. So we thought we, it, was, it is better to call both of them. Um, the third, the last theme is the role of heat and cold. Heat and cold actually has a very interesting role in determining the outcome of childbirth, especially the durations of labor pain. Heat is taken as beneficial and help with labor progression. The first major, that's why the first major, whether the woman is alone or there is a caregiver that is taken when they're in labor is to provide women with something warm, whether it's food or making fire or like putting up more blankets. On the contrary, cold increases the time. Cold is believed to increase the time of labor. So as one of my prim, one of my participants stated that this time the labor was very long. They're saying that I must have been cold that summer. And this also have, this is one of the major consideration they make when they are choosing the place to deliver. And one of the reason why women do not want to go to the birthing center in the community. 
um, to the point that sometimes it is valued more valued um, valued more than the medical support. One of my participants stated that there is no place to make fire in the clinic. It is very cold. It would be nice to have a place to make a fire. Similarly, another participant who had given birth to her first baby in Kathmandu and was planning to go to give birth to her second baby in Kathmandu stated that at, the end, at last she decided not to go because in Kathmandu there is no place to make fire. Um, so kind of looking into all the findings and listening to all the stories of the women, I came up with four major recommendations. And my first recommendation would be kind of, we should, we should really think about, think, think and take women as the center and prioritize them rather than what is deemed as proven interventions. Women should be consulted before designing and implementing any program and policy so that we do not build another birthing center on the land that women hesitate to go. The story of women in this study reemphasized the significance of integrating social and cultural belief and values in maternal service, rather than looking at them as a barrier and something to fight against, because social culture belief and values are here to stay, so that we can provide women a space where they can feel culturally safe without depriving them from the benefits of formal maternal services. And another thing that I feel would be important to consider in this, in, in communities like Upper Dopa or Dopa Buddha Ruler Municipality is, there is a high emphasis on institutionalizations and medicalizations of maternal services. But if the institutions are still not really well equipped to provide all their services, maybe we should think about taking the service to where the women are. And I see a great potential in this, especially women do not, um, women do not have any kind of distrust or do not reject medicals, medical help. They have sought medical help, but the only thing is that there, there is some kind of gap in the formal medic, medical services as, and their culture. Um, this kind of brings to the end of my formal presentations, but I have a lot of people to acknowledge since we don't have much time, I'll just make it in a group. So I would like to express immense gratitude to my thesis committee, um, Natalie Williams, my chair, and David Citrin, who have been through the thick and thin of this journey with me. Um, all the women in this story for sharing some of the very personal stories with me, my family and friends, and uh, DGS faculties and staff. And this brings to the end of my presentations and I will welcome any questions that you have. Thank you. Wow, so interesting and such a beautiful presentation. Thank you so much, Wang Mo. Thank you. I'll pause for questions. Yeah, so I see a couple already. Um, uh, let's see. So let's start with a student question. This is from Anupa who says, uh, such an amazing presentation, Angmo. Thank you for this important work. Uh, my question, what were some challenges in doing research in a community that you are so deeply connected to and familiar with? Thank you, Anova. Such a good question. <laughs> um, it's been kind of, um, you know, um, when I started this research, I always thought like, oh, I'm the insider, you know, so it would be kind of, easier for me um, than anyone else who will be, who, who if someone outsider who will have to do this question, this research. But then when I actually started taking interviews, I really struggle kind of thinking what new I'm getting from these interviews. And it was as if I was looking for something that is really surprising and I have no idea. And it really kind of was put me off. You know, I was like, what am I looking? What? what is what am I getting and it took me so much time just to kind of take myself out of that space of oh I'm from here and I'm looking for something new to like I'm here to study and I should have the mindset that I do not know anything and I'm here to learn from these women so I took break from my interviews I talked to my thesis committee I talked to my peers like what you think, you know, like just sometimes some piece of like, what you think about this? And they'll be like, oh, really? That's that's so new kind of thing that really kind of helped me to um, go through that process. So that was that was a really kind of um, learning for me to really understand you know, you being insider doesn't mean that you are a good researcher um, or you are perfect for that setting. Of course, there is a lot of uh, positive uh, benefit and uh, positive thing about being insider, but I see a lot of potentials in going together uh, outsider who have no idea about that community and an insider who have a lot of idea in that community together and doing like 
research together, I think that we could do a lot better and good work, I guess. Beautiful. Um, I see a question from Awa who says, Angmo, this is beautiful work. Do you think the Ministry of Health will be open to receiving these recommendations? If so, how would you share it with them? Um, I, I can, I feel like yes and no both. <laughs> I cannot say yes totally. Um, definitely, I feel like my advantage here is because this is an area that is understudied and very, there is very like few literature out there and also Nepal is uh, aspiring to achieve this sustainable development goal right right now so we have done all the easy fix and now it's really a time to look into all these areas where there are there is a lot of work to be done and that means it should go beyond just like emphasizing institutional deliveries you should come to inf institutions you know and it is not um, right now when the government think about okay institutional deliveries they just build a build a birthing center and they say we already have a place so then now the community will just come in there and then like in the community that we conducted study right now the birthing center has been there since 2013 until then there is only one delivery that took in that birthing center so why is there no no delivery like despite the so so much resources have already been spent in building birthing centers right and in that case if i kind of present all these recommendations and data i feel like there is some opportunities for the Ministry of Health to really consider, you know, maybe we should look into these things. But I'm also more um, at this point hopeful because of the local, uh, there is local unit right now, like local government, so which I have already kind of worked before as well, and they have some power. So I feel more hopeful than before when there is no local government where I have to always reach to the center. And it's very, it's very hard to explain these things to people who have never been to these places, you know. So kind of Great. helpful. <laughs> Great, so I'm gonna squeeze this in in 30 seconds if you can respond to Deepa's question who says, just wondering if you have, uh, if you have ideas on how the healthcare system can adjust to the cultural norms, norm of secrecy around pregnancy. And could I add to that too? Um, just wanted to say from what you just responded to, it seems like a push pull between modernity and tradition and healthcare system and cultural norms and values. And I'm, how do they adjust to fit each other? I guess I was trying to get specific as I typed it, but um, I don't know if you have thoughts on that because I would think the ministry would, would just say, oh, the culture needs to change. And then, you know, <laughs> we're trying to honor culture and tradition. And how do you navigate that balance? Um. Such a great question. I thought about that a lot when I was writing <laughs> my paper, like what can we do? <laughs> so um, at this point right now, since um, the whole, like especially the birthing center, I feel is not really well equipped to kind of provide all the services. Um, I feel like kind of shifting the approach to maybe taking, um, you know, like the service to women can be an answer. It has proven kind of well, and effective in decreasing neonatal morbidity and mortality. But over the long period of the time, I was also looking into like maternal um, maternity waiting rooms or stuff like that, right? And I feel like that has a potential, you know? So maybe if we can create a place where women can come a um, few days, you know, like a few days or a week before their expected delivery date, um, then that doesn't mean they're going there in labor pain at that time. So they can wait there and they still will be like, people will say, oh, they're waiting there, but that doesn't mean they're in labor pain at that time. So that can be an option. And um, there is also like, I feel emphasizing really uh, through what you call plural medicines, right? Not only Western medicine, but also having armchairs and, you know, like the local are providing them space to do their rituals. And um, there is some kind of trust, but then if we integrate all of them, there would be more trust. And I feel like that would really be a foundation for them to say, oh, it's not only if we can, even if it is not secret, we they will sp still feel spiritually and uh, medically safe, I feel. And that will really change rather than just saying like, it's only the doctor in the clinic and you have to be there. Oh, thank you. So much. Am I okay to wrap up? Yep. Okay, because there's a, there's a lot of things to say about this cohort. By the way, I must. I I know we're only at the end of day one, 
But for those of you who may not be joining us tomorrow, let me just say so much that, wow, I'm so impressed by the body of work that you've all demonstrated today, especially given the fact that if we think back, your cohort was fully online the first year and look how much you've accomplished since then. Some of you, I don't think I've ever met in person. <laughs> So, um, but I, uh, you know, we shared so much online and you've worked so hard. Congratulations on finishing and thank you to all of your supporters, the faculty, the staff, your peers, your friends and family. Um, thank you everybody for joining us and for supporting our students. Thank you, especially for our MPH staff, Andreas, who's not here, Julie Burnett, Nuri Yusufa, who organized the day and co-moderated with me. Thank you so much. This wouldn't happen without a, your highly organized uh, manner. So thank you so much. And um, I will, um, I guess, call it the end of day one. Yeah, so tomorrow starts at noon and mm -hmm. we've got an excellent batch of students as well tomorrow. Uh, uh, Bernardo will be moderating tomorrow's session, so I think that'll also be a really great day. Yeah. And these recordings, I've been getting a lot of questions about the recordings. Uh, give me till Friday, okay? And I should, I'll, I'll send it out to everyone. So by Friday, oh. you'll get the recordings. And Wangma has her, her hand up. Go ahead. I just wanted, um, can you give me like a minute? Um, it's like, I just have a lot of people here um, who made it possible for me to come here, even like in your, so I just want to kind of take time to thank them. Um, I think in English, you have a proverb called like, it takes a village and it actually took a village for me to come here. <laughs> so <laughs> I have a lot of people from, um, I don't know, how, it's kind of sentimental. Um, so I made this journey from a remote um, Nepal to all the way to UW, and there are so many people who actually make this possible. There is um, someone um, who started the village, who started a school in our village so that we can get primary education and she was supposed to join today. Maybe she's not here from France. And I have all my nomads family um, who actually kind of make me believe that I can do it. <laughs> so here is, Roshi Jan, Halifax, my friend, Wendy, I can see Noah, <laughs> all of them really make me feel like you can do it, you know, because it's hard for us to can actually believe in ourselves because we don't have, we haven't seen anyone at this, at this position. So we limit a lot of, uh, we limit before even like dreaming those. So all these people really kind of make me feel that I can do it. And that's why I started the process and, um, yeah, so Anthony cannot be here. He funded all, he sponsored my program because of which I am in in UW and all my friends who uh, who make me feel home in this unfamiliar land. So I just wanted to say thank you to all of you. And my thesis committee, of course. <laughs> so they have to also be my English teacher. You know, like I thought like it would have been nicer for them if there is if they guide an American student, whereas like if they guide me, they will have to go through all my grammars and like you know, all the spellings. But <laughs> they've been very passionate and supportive. So thank you everyone. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> We're so proud of you, Angmo. So grateful. Thank you so much for saying that, Wang Mo. And a uh, really nice way to sum up the day, you know. And thank you for coming here and enriching our cohort. All of you, we're so proud of all of you and so happy with what you've accomplished. So. All right, thank you all so much for your time and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow as well if you're able to make it. So thank you and have a lovely afternoon. Thank you Deepa for moderating this and just leading it, that was great. All right, take care all. Bye everybody. Bye.